The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12670 in the name of Hamza Yusuf on Scotland's place in Europe. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak buttons now. And I call on Hamza Yusuf to speak to and move the motion. Minister, 14 minutes. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, colleagues, Scotland has been a progressive and integral part of the European Union for the last 40 years. Engagement with the European Union and its institutions is a core priority for this government. It's a priority that is, uh, that is central to our programme for government, uh, with a focus on driving sustainable growth, but also tied with that, of course, tackling inequalities, and one that flows from Scotland's economic strategy, uh, which has an internationalisation at its core, and at its core of that, engagement with the European Union. I want to focus today on Scotland's place in the European Union. First, our strategic priorities for engagement in that union, our successes and how we're building on those successes. Uh, secondly, perhaps focus on some of the benefits of EU membership and that EU membership brings uh, to Scotland and vice versa, and why it's vital that this membership uh, very much continues. And perhaps lastly, touch upon and spell out why it would be completely unacceptable for Scotland to be dragged from the Union uh, against her will, why we need to put in place appropriate safeguards to prevent that from happening. Uh, colleagues, the, the institutions in Brussels have undergone considerable renewal and change over the last year or so. Elections to the European Parliament in May 2014 have returned many new MEPs from across Europe, uh, but they have also returned a number uh, of uh, strengthened Eurosceptic uh, parties and, and, and members, a symptom perhaps of the frustration that's felt uh, by EU citizens that the institutions have grown too remote uh, from the citizens that they are meant to serve. Uh, there is, of course, a new European Commission under the presidency of Jean-Claude Juncker has taken office with significant changes to its feel and to its structure. Uh, this includes a beefed-up role for vice presidents who over the next five years will be responsible for overseeing the delivery of key strategic objectives around, for example, energy, economic growth, the completion of the single market. Uh, the, com the Commission has now published its uh, work programme for 2015, a 23-point plan aimed at progressing the Commission's own EU 2020 growth strategy. This programme is designed to deliver smart, sustainable and inclusive growth across the entire continent. It fits squarely with our own economic agenda, which has an economic focus, of course, uh, but also a social focus too. Uh, I wrote to the EERC earlier this year, setting out the key areas of interest for the Scottish Government, and a copy of that letter is available in SPICE. However, critical issues for Scotland in this work programme uh, include, amongst many other things, ensuring the successful agreement to the so-called Juncker Investment Package, a loan guarantee fund designed to deliver up to 315 billion euros in funding to kickstart a whole pipeline of capital projects across the EU, including, we hope, in Scotland. We also attach great importance to the, complete, the completion of the single market and digital infrastructure, abolishing EU roaming charges and delivering an ambitious international climate, climate agreement, of which Scotland has been a, a leader in discussions up to this point. Uh, in terms Yes, of course. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for uh, taking intervention. He'll be aware of the importance of structural funding to the region um, that uh, I partly represent in Orkney. There's been some concern uh, at the back end of last year about decisions about how the allocation of that funding uh, may be distributed in, in, in the Highlands and Islands being centralised more to, uh, to, to, to Edinburgh rather than has been the case in the past by partners in the Highlands and Islands. Can you give some reassurance that that will not be the case, those decisions will be taken in the Highlands and Islands? Minister. Yes, it's, it's an issue that uh, I know the member has raised before, and I hope he's had previous reassurances. I know he has had reassurances, in fact, uh, from this government, and we would share those concerns, and I'm happy to give uh, reassurances uh, to the member uh, in that regard. I also uh, hope to give some reassurances in this debate uh, to, to Horizon 2020, which I know has been raised uh, previously by the member uh, Claire Baker and indeed raised to me personally by uh, those in the academic sector and it uh, should be said Horizon 2020 we see as a very successful program. Uh, we've had uh, Scottish academics and institutions uh, have had a great amount of funding from it punching uh, above our weight and uh, of course any further reduction in Horizon 2020 would certainly uh, give us cause for concern. I raised the issue personally uh, with the UK government. And I, fair to say, across the, uh, across the table, a number of UK government ministers uh, present, all of us shared 
uh, our, our concern of that. I would hope uh, that the UNCA investment package would uh, allow opportunities for educational establishments and academic institutions to be able to, to, get, to get more funding. And to put it into context uh, of Horizon 2020, that although the, there has been a reduction in this budget uh, in, terms of a, uh, in terms of a monetary reduction, in terms of percentage, it's increased by around about 30 uh, 8%, but I hope to give reassurances on that uh, during this debate. Uh, let me touch brief briefly on the, on the benefits of uh, EU membership uh, shortly, but it's important to see the Union, uh, European Union, not just as a place in which rules and regulations are made as important as they are. The Union uh, is so much more. It's a marketplace for exchanging ideas, uh, for showcasing where Scotland can display leadership. We've displayed leadership through our uh, hard-working uh, Brussels office. That's included in the field of energy policy, which I know is of interest of members here. We've worked closely with states and sub-states to increase the visibility of marine renewable energy. Uh, Scotland also has played a leading role in the Vanguard initiative, again familiar to members across this chamber, a collaboration of 25 innovative European regions that aims to influence uh, EU innovation industrial policies through collaboration. Uh, the initiative has been active on advanced manufacturing, where Scotland most certainly has a role to play. And we look forward to welcoming members of the Vanguard Initiative in Edinburgh to a visit here next week. We've also gathered support, uh, we've also gathered support in a number of EU member states as a consequence of lobbying uh, for the right to introduce minimum unit pricing for alcohol following the referral of the Scottish Government to the European Court. The Scottish Government has uh, never argued that the EU is perfect. In fact, in every single member state uh, I've, I've come across has never argued that the European Union uh, is perfect. The institutions of the EU have grown too distant from uh, their citizens. Uh, there is a need for those institutions to reconnect. Key to that is pursuing an, an agenda that is generally adds value and addresses those issues uh, that are problems for citizens across uh, the European Union. That's why we've welcomed very much the Commission's plan to tackle stubbornly high youth unemployment, to promote energy security through the Energy Union package, to tackle climate change or build North Sea's grid. Of course, members will be aware of our own document, um, e our EU uh, reform agenda. Uh, but the Commission uh, agenda also needs to address many other issues uh, as well. And that includes tackling red tape, uh, for example, by decentralising fisheries management, reducing the complexity of the common agricultural policy, extending impact assessments to the additional stages of the regulatory process, and giving subnational parliaments, such as this one, a greater say in ensuring that proposed EU legislation respects the subsidiarity principle. The Commission's own uh, refit programme, which will examine the suitability of existing rules is very welcome. Indeed, the Scottish Government uh, has seconded a senior official on the European, uh, to the European Commission to undertake a review of birds and habitats directive under the REFIT programme. I know that's something that's been raised by a number of environmental organisations, with myself and my colleague, uh, Dr McLeod, and again, to give reassurances uh, that we would be uh, looking uh, for that REFIT programme to uh, maintain and increase standards, uh, nothing uh, less than that. Uh, these sort of reforms, I've just argued, for are about things uh, in the EU, doing things in the EU better and doing things smarter. Of course, EU institutions must also do their part to ensure that they operate transparently. Uh, and perhaps this is most, uh, uh, maybe perhaps we can, uh, this is of most importance in the current TTIP uh, negotiations that are taking place. I'm pleased that the Commission has taken board uh, that issue of transparency. We're now seeing documentations, discussions uh, being put online. And while the Scottish Government certainly acknowledges uh, that TTIP could well bring uh, benefits. More needs to be done to address our concerns about the potential impact uh, on the NHS, public services, and indeed, of course, ISDS. We'll continue to monitor uh, TTIP, of course. Thank the member for giving way. And on this issue of TTIP, would you, would you accept that, in fact, we probably have more common ground with some of our European neighbours uh, than we do sometimes with the London government on these kind of issues as far as commitment to public services is concerned? I was doing my best, uh, Mr Mason, to, to be as consensual as I could uh, in this debate. And so I would say that uh, you know, the UK government knows our position, uh, knows certainly that we are asking for a black and white exemption for the NHS. And that's what the people want. Now, that's certainly what the Scottish government, in fact, a number of parties across this chamber uh, want, uh, because uh, the, the, uh, 
these, the soundings in the, that are coming from the Commission at the moment and from politicians, people uh, aren't quite sure of them, are, are not convinced by them. And therefore, if we're being told that there's no threat to the NHS, uh, if we've been told that by the UK government, being told that by the Commission, I can see no reason as to why there shouldn't be uh, that black and white exemption that the First Minister herself uh, has called for. And as the, as the member says, that is shared uh, across Europe when it comes to public services. Uh, in spite of, of all this, my point is that the, uh, some of the concerns that we have, in spite of all those concerns, my uh, point is that currently uh, treaty, uh, the treaty pay framework uh, is suitable uh, in terms of a, a legal basis for affecting that necessary change. Uh, we don't believe that there's a need uh, for treaty change uh, for, these reform, for, this ref for these reforms to take place. Indeed, many of them uh, can be, uh, best be accomplished through existing programmes uh, being operated by the Euro European Commission uh, such as EU 2020. In terms of the, the, the benefits uh, of being part of the European Union, I think politicians, uh, political parties, uh, and we need civic society and perhaps the business sector too, we need to do more to talk about some of those benefits. I don't think we do enough. Uh, our membership of the European Union uh, gives us access to 500 million citizens. It also gives us access to around 20 billion uh, 20 million, 20 billion would be quite something, 20 million businesses that operate uh, across the EU and that single market. The EU is a vital export market for Scottish firms, accounting for almost half, 46% of Scotland's international exports in 2013. That's a massive almost £13 billion pounds each year. Almost 40% of the 2,100 foreign-owned businesses uh, in Scotland were owned by firms based in the European Union. And every year since 2006, Scotland has been ranked one of the top two areas outside of the UK, outside of London, uh, within the UK, to attract inward investment. Uh, research suggests that over 330,000 Scottish jobs were associated with exports to the EU. Uh, of course, the membership... Uh, yes, of course. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that there's still more to be done within the domestic market to encourage more uh, small and medium-sized businesses to look at the potential for export within the European market? Minister. Yes, I agree entirely. Internationalisation was uh, one of the key four, four priorities of Scotland's economic strategy launched a couple of weeks ago by the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. On top of that, though, uh, I agree entirely uh, with what the member is saying. Too few companies in Scotland export in too few sectors to too few countries. And so we have to, it's a, it's a commitment from the government, a priority I should say from the government and also our agencies like Scottish Development International to try to increase that pool as small and medium sized businesses uh, must certainly be a part of that. Uh, related to this, uh, presiding officer, it's important that we don't just view our relationship with the European Union as simply a business transaction. It's much, much uh, more uh, than, than do, do, doing that. And I think through the, the, the new president, uh, President Juncker has been very clear that uh, the protection, uh, protecting the welfare uh, of our citizens in the EU, promoting equality, improved conditions for workers, uh, strengthening consumer rights are an important part uh, of the agenda and of the relationship. I also welcome uh, the social, cultural and economic benefits that migration uh, from the EU delivers to Scotland's communities. The right uh, to freedom of movement is also a huge benefit. Uh, to Scots. Uh, a huge benefit, of course, for Scots who, who move to live, study uh, and, and, and work elsewhere in the EU. It's estimated that uh, 171,000 people uh, born elsewhere in the EU currently live in Scotland. So that is very much a two-way exchange that benefits Scotland, but also benefits, I would hope, uh, the rest of the European Union. And there is a lot of negative rhetoric around migration, migration from Europe. I looked at one study from UCL, uh, which said that actually EU migrants from 2001 and 2011 benefited economically, a net benefit of £20 billion. And all of us as politicians have an important job to ensure that we're not letting ourselves get dragged down into negativity, uh, into hostility uh, when, during, uh, in, in the course of this debate. Uh, Scotland can, wants to continue, of course, to be uh, an, an, a constructive member of the European Union. Uh, and we have a general election coming up, of course, in uh, seven weeks on Thursday and a part of that discussion and debate has been the in-out uh, referendum. The Scottish Government does not support uh, the Prime Minister's proposals uh, for that in-out referendum. We believe it puts uh, our membership, it puts our businesses, our academic sector most certainly at risk. Uh, we should, of course, as parliamentarians, uh, not uh, wait for that in-out referendum to put the positive case for Europe uh, on the table. Uh, in, in that regard, uh, 
presiding officer, I would like to reiterate, close, and I will just end on this point, uh, that of course we uh, believe that there should be a double majority system for that in a referendum. We believe that Scotland uh, and indeed the other parts of the United Kingdom should not be dragged outside of the European Union against their will. That's why we put in this motion, which of course I'm happy to move on behalf of the government, uh, a proposal that, that no nation, that, that the UK in fact, should not be dragged out of Europe uh, if there is not a majority, not just in the entire UK, but in each of those countries. This government will continue to press for a double majority voting system in the event of a future referendum. And if Scotland is, after all, an equal member of the United Kingdom, its voice should be listened. Thanks so much. I now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 12670.2. Ten minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be opening this debate for Labour this afternoon. It's my first opening speech in this area of my portfolio. And as a previous lead on rural affairs, food and environment, I did often speak about the importance of Europe to the delivery of policy in these areas. Uh, they are good examples of Scotland's positive relationship with Europe, and I may return to them later in my opening comments. Uh, the first election I voted in was for the European Parliament. Unfortunately, I was, and I continue to be, part of the minority of the electorate who takes part in these elections. Just over 33% of the electorate took part in May 2014, and that was in a year when interest in elections in Scotland was very high. Um, across Europe, the picture is not much better. Although higher than a third of our electorate, it was still the lowest recorded turnout figure. And in many ways, Europe is high on the political agenda for the political classes, but it remains low for the voters. There are uh, just briefly, because I'm quite short with time. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, does the member recall when the UK entered Europe in 1973, the EU anyway, mm -hmm. that uh, most of the major broadcasting and print media organisations had correspondence in Brussels? I understand virtually none now do. Perhaps some of the responsibility lies there. Claire Baker. I am pleased to say I don't have much recall of 1973, but I think the member <laughs> makes a fair point on it's not just down to politicians, it is also down to our society and our, our media to fairly represent Europe working for us. Um, however, I would suggest that high on the agenda why people don't engage with the election is a lack of understanding of what Europe delivers for us in a modern world, combined with a lack of confidence that Europe is actually working for the ordinary person. We are seeing huge economic challenges across Europe. Our fellow Europeans in many economies are suffering levels of poverty and economic downturn that, downturn that have not experienced for many years. Many countries are seeing a crisis in youth unemployment, which leads to significant social problems and often depopulation, as those who can are leaving those countries for opportunities elsewhere. Um, in response to this, Europe, the Parliament, the Commission, the Council of Ministers, far too many people, it does, for, for too many people it looks like it's not responding. It's still often bureaucratic, slow to respond, <coughs> driven from the centre and inflexible. Um, and here's my first reference to my previous area of knowledge. The Common Agricultural Policy takes up 38% of the EU budget. This is a reduction on previous years, but it's still a significant share of Europe's support. And during the recent reform process, attempts were made to increase the environmental delivery of the policy, to support rural economies, to deliver fairness across the member states, and have an increased focus on jobs and the economy. But I would say focus in these areas was um, slow, and can we really say that as working in the public interest? Um, the role that the European Parliament played in these negotiations was important. Uh, it was the first example of co-decision making, but change is slow and challenging. We need to see greater reform of the Commission and its bureaucracy, the Parliament and its accountability, and the economic model of the Eurozone, which for too many economies is now imbalanced. So how do we have a Europe that works more transparently in the interests of all its people? Because, as many of us will see here this afternoon, it is hugely important to our economy. It seems to be one area in our proposals that we agree on. Across the UK, there are some 3 million jobs dependent on our membership of the EU, 200,000 companies and £200 billion worth of annual exports, and £450 billion of inward investment, which are tied to trade with these partners. And for example, in Scotland, we benefit by access to a single market of over 500 million consumers, with Scottish exports to the EU accounting for almost 50% of our international exports. It also means recognising the benefits we get from EU members who come to choose to live and work in Scotland. Scotland has a long tradition of welcoming and working with people from other countries. And as a Fife MSP, I represent an area with a long history with the Polish community in particular. And we should recognise the contribution that people are making when they come here to our economy. 
we have an ageing population and we need people to help drive our economy. This is not to ignore the challenges it can present, and last week the BBC ran a report on immigration with a number of findings that politicians can't ignore. Yes, we need a welfare system, a housing system, an education system that balances the needs of everyone. But migrants contribute more to the economy than the resources that they use. And many businesses I speak to, those in the food sector, the agricultural sector, the textile sector, couldn't operate without employees from EU member states. Migration brings huge benefits to our country, and that is a fact of our economy and of who we are. Those of us here, and I'm sure we'll have disagreements during the course of this debate, but those of us here who believe that the European Union is a good thing, is beneficial to Scotland and the UK, who support its founding principles and recognise if it didn't already exist and an expanding and global world, we would have to create it, we need to positively support membership. Of course, we need to work to improve the benefits of the EU and not deny the difficult times it is currently facing. But we must argue strongly that ultimately it's a positive union that contributes to our modern world and our economy. And we shouldn't underestimate the global challenges that are facing Europe. Other economies and continents with greater populations who are increasing their investment into education and their enterprise, they have growing markets and industries, these will all present economic challenges. Future trade deals are important. Labour's amendment today recognises that but also reflects our position on the protection of public services and trade deals. Facing the increasing challenge of global competitiveness by working collectively, EU members will be in a stronger position than if they were alone. We will be in a better position to get the best deals in trade, tackle pollution, take action on money laundering and corruption and a whole number of areas when we are working within the EU. European cooperation is important in so many areas. So many of our modern challenges do not recognise borders. Internet fraud, copyright crime, human trafficking, if we look back at the horsemeat scandal a few years ago and the complex food systems we now have to deal with, that was a prime example of the importance of European cooperation to address the issue. Scotland, as part of the UK, can demonstrate how the European Parliament and the Commission can be used for good. So many of our progressive social policies originated in the EU, driving common standards for workers across the EU, maternity leave, paternity leave, working hours. Many of our environmental targets come from the EU, biodiversity targets, air quality, water quality, and we must do more to deliver on these targets. Scotland does have ambitious targets in this area, but in recent years we have not been achieving these targets. We are even currently in the position of the Commission being prepared to take legal action over air quality with a lack of progress across the UK. In these areas, we do have a responsibility to do more to deliver, and our actions in these areas would support the credibility of the EU. Um, the European Char Parliament has championed new initiatives to reduce youth unemployment, and it is the focus for much debate on progressive working practices. Our amendment calls for this to be a central focus of ongoing European activity. That is why it was disappointing last week when SNP MEPs abstained over a vote to phase out precarious employment and tackle the exploitative nature of too many zero-hour contracts. This is the kind of area Europe should be leading on, and it was disappointing not to have the SNP's support. Our amendment today also states our opposition to the proposed cuts to Horizon 2020 that the Minister also referred to. Um, I raised my concerns with the Minister last week, and I'm glad that he um, recognised that. Scottish universities benefit considerably from this fund. It meets the objectives of economic growth and investment into research, and we must do more to resist the cuts to it. And there are concerns that as things stand, the proposed changes that the Minister referred to, um, there are still concerns that they're not an appropriate funding mechanism for research and development, and they may hinder innovation across Europe. Um, that is why Labour members at, in the European Parliament are looking to amend uh, the proposals on Horizon 2020. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, this afternoon we won't be supporting other parties' proposals. Encouragingly, all the motions do recognise the importance of membership of the EU. However, we do not support an in-out referendum as presented by the Conservatives. Uh, I don't believe it would be in the interest of the people of the UK. Um, the SNP this afternoon attempt to put their case for a veto. Um, I don't believe this is a credible position. In September last year, Scotland voted to stay in the UK with the full knowledge that there was the possibility of an EU referendum. We voted to be part of the UK, and any vote on a national basis would have to be treated as such. It would have to be a decision made collectively by people living in the UK. 
And Nicola Sturgeon claimed that a referendum was inevitable, almost regardless who, whoever wins the general election. Um, that's not true. Labour doesn't support a referendum, believing I'm in my final minute. Um, Labour doesn't support a referendum, believing it will cause uncertainty for business. And we know that this is true, and it's not in the interest of the UK. Um, Presiding officer, I look forward to this afternoon's debate. We do have different views across the Chamber on referendums, on Scotland's place in the UK and the EU, but I do hope we do not miss the opportunity this afternoon to put forward the positive case for our involvement in Europe, recognise the challenges it presents, but also the opportunities and advantages it offer, offers us. Um, I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Jamie McGregor to speak to and move Amendment 12670.1. Mr McGregor, you have six minutes on the by, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate uh, as it gives me a chance to dispel myths and scaremongering coming from the government benches on Scotland's membership of the European Union. It also gives me the opportunity to once again reaffirm the commitment of Conservatives to making the EU work in the best interests of Scotland and the wider UK. That's the whole point. This club has to work for its members, and that will only be truly achievable through reforming the EU, through renegotiation with our European partners to create a new favourable settlement for the UK and for the rest of Europe, to cut out red tape and excessive baggage for everyone, including new entrants, and encourage growth and an end to stagnation. When the Conservatives win the forthcoming general election, with an overall majority, and David Cameron is returned to Downing Street, we can begin the process of bringing about that necessary change. And it's always been a cast-iron guarantee of the UK government uh, to then put to the British people a simple question. Do you wish to stay in the EU on the basis of a reformed EU, or do you not? That referendum is likely to happen in late 2017. If Conservative ministers achieve these reforms and transform the EU and the UK's relationship with it, David Cameron has stated he will campaign for the UK to remain a member state. As a committed European myself, I'll be joining the Prime Minister in that pro-EU campaign. But only if reform in the interests of Scotland and the UK has been delivered. So let's dispel SNP myth one. The majority of Conservatives north and south of the border are not anti-European. We simply want change in Europe, as do the British people, and I'm sure the Minister has to accept that. It's not only the UK who wants to see change. Countries across the EU, such as Angela Merkel's Germany, the Netherlands and the Netherlands, have argued that the EU in its present form is too centralist and isn't working for member states. Indeed, the Dutch phrase, European where necessary, national where possible, shows the shift away from an ever closer union and this from one of the original six countries which was so federalist originally. So another SNP myth that it is only the UK government who see the EU reform as a priority is dismissed as well. Um, well, I've only got six minutes. Can I make a bit more? We then have the SNP's assertion that Scotland has no appetite for a referendum on EU membership. This is despite the fact that polling has consistently shown that almost 60% of Scots want a referendum, and that includes over 60% of SNP voters. There is a trace of arrogance, surely, in the Scottish Government's motion, which suggests we know best, so we won't trouble you with a direct say on EU membership. It's clear that the majority of Scots do want a say. Our amendment, our amendment justifiably highlights the need for a referendum, which is UK-wide, takes place on a one-person, one-vote basis, and decided by a simple majority, as it was in the 1975 referendum. Let us remember that in the 1975 referendum, the SNP campaigned against continued membership of the common market, whereas the majority of Conservatives, myself included, supported our position in Europe. The government's motion turns that principle on its head with its cumbersome double majority proposal, which splits the UK into its constituent parts of Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland in the referendum question. The government suggests that Scotland should not be forced to leave the EU, even if the rest of the UK chooses to do so. It's ironic, isn't it, that the SNP should give a proposal of this nature. I don't recall them arguing in the referendum to break up the United Kingdom that if another constituent part of the UK didn't want to leave, then a separation wouldn't happen. As a member of this Parliament's European 
and external relations committee, I spent a considerable amount of time with colleagues in conducting an inquiry into an independent Scotland's position in the EU. And I won't rehash the arguments regarding whether Article 48 or Article 49 should apply. What I will say is that while it was shown that an independent Scotland would not automatically be admitted as a member of the EU, it is also true that if the UK chose to leave the EU, then Scotland could not remain as part of the EU. The SNP position is simply untenable. It's conjecture. We are probably, but, where we are probably united across this chamber is the part in the government's motion which speaks about the benefits of the EU membership to Scotland through the single market. Access to consumers and businesses on the continent have obviously been of huge economic importance to Scotland, as well as the references to the benefits of EU membership, both socially, culturally and educationally. To give one example, the benefit of Objective 1 status to the Highlands and Islands is the construction of the number of causeways and bridges and infrastructure projects which have left such a valuable legacy. I do emphasise that these benefits have only been possible by UK membership of the EU, and it's a pity um, that we don't have Objective 1 anymore in the Highlands and Islands. However, the proposed 2017 referendum has been brought about for various reasons. Businesses in Scotland and in the rest of the UK find the extent of European interference in their everyday life sometimes excessive, and red tape can strangle creativity. People I've spoken to over many years continue to feel that decisions taken in Brussels are remote and removed from the people that they actually elected. That's not every decision, just some of them. There are concerns and worries that the relaxed nature of European rules means that people arriving into the UK are allowed to claim benefits without having worked here. EU enlargement, while welcome, must not lead to unmanageable consequences for member states. As you draw and to a close, please. I'm just going to close. Uh, for all these reasons and many more, the need for a referendum on EU membership will become further apparent over the next two years, where the British people will take part in a debate on Scotland and the UK's position in the EU. Thank you. I move the amendment in my name. Thanks so much. And we now move to the open debate. And I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Six minutes speeches or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. In the last um, four years as a convener of the European External Relations Committee, I've not only learned a lot about Europe, but I've learned a lot more about its strengths as well. The basic principle of Europe is a peacemaker. The strong, positive corporate self-interest ensuring the safety and protection of all of the nations within. Yes, there are weaknesses and sometimes tensions, and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership is an, a, a very good example of that. And I commend to you, Presiding Officer, and my colleagues in the Chamber today, the report published by the European and External Relations Committee on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. But, presiding officer, the EU is a very pragmatic creation. In spite of its huge size, the answers to challenging situations can usually be found. There is an underlying consensus which is not much discussed. It's just there because all of the member nations want pretty much the same things. They want equality. They want fairness. They want tolerance. They want our human rights protected. They don't want illegal wars, and they have an overarching European Parliament which upholds those values. Which can be difficult, given some of the Eurosceptic MEPs elected in the last round of elections. Some calling for the human rights laws to be abolished. Presiding officer, the EU has another side. It's a vast trading market too, with 500 million people and 22 million businesses. Scotland's substantial export markets are constantly building trade with our European partners. However, when it comes to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, there are serious concerns to be addressed, protection of public services being paramount. But of course, it is much, much more than a simple free trade association. The EU principles reflect those of the Scottish Government, I believe. We welcome the role that the EU plays in protecting the social welfare of its citizens, including people who need to claim benefits. We seek to influence those decisions that will impact on us on a daily basis. 
We want to work from within the EU. We don't want to be forced out by a right-wing, UKIP-friendly Westminster government. We know that Europe is where we need to be for trade, for the free movement of people, for our own human protection and for the great cultural melting pot that is the bloc of nations, each with our own unique background and history. And last Wednesday night, presiding officer, I had the great privilege and pleasure of hosting the Latvian ambassador who brought some of the most amazing, talented musicians to play some Rachmaninoff for us on Wednesday night. However, they finished with their own rendition of Loch Lomond, which I have to say was the most beautiful piece of music I have ever heard in my entire life. So let's not forget the foundations of Europe. Let's not forget the origins. Let's not forget the founder countries and where they came from. And they all tell their own story. France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Netherlands and Germany. You don't have to go very far to understand where the foundations of the EU came from and the reasons for it. So, presiding officer, I don't want an in and out referendum. The Scottish Government doesn't want one. But once again, we're being shoved into a battle we don't need and one that we don't support. I want to see changes in Europe and the mechanisms are already in place for us to work towards that. The existing treaties provide the framework. There is no need to try and renegotiate them now, no matter how big you want to appear in front of your colleagues at Westminster. As is often the case, the EU institutions won't do much in the way of their own publicity. The shrill voices of extremists, and I use that word deliberately, will be as loud as they are daft. Scots are not fooled by this nonsense. While David Coburn slings abuse at our Foreign Affairs Minister, he is very happy to pick up the €5 million Euros or so that he collects for staffing and his own salary and expenses, but to denigrate the institution which gives him that opportunity. If we are to be forced into this referendum, then at the very least we will demand that as one member of our four nations, that David Cameron has called on many occasions this family of nations. Only a family of nations during the referendum doesn't seem to be a family of nations now. We are each an equal member. Then Scotland's decision needs to be the same as England's, Wales and Northern Ireland's for that vote to be carried. It is neither democratic nor legitimate to tolerate a situation where one of the family imposes its will upon the other three. And I am very disappointed that Labour will not back, back that very important right as an equal member of that said family of nations. Former European Commission President José Manuel Barroso, remember him, everybody listened to him during the Scottish referendum, maybe they should listen to him now. He said, what will be the influence of Britain, of the British Prime Minister, if he was not part of the European Union? His influence would be zero. So before Mr Cameron sails off into the sunset with his Union Jack flying and his supporters from UKIP applauding his achievement, he needs to think very, very carefully about his own job prospects as well as those of the people of the UK. The sunset may well turn out to be an exit from the strong and protective arms of his much-valued family of nations. Thank you very much. Now I call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Christian Alain. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to, co to contribute to this afternoon's debate and to support my colleague Claire Baker's amendment. While there is much debate about Britain's place in Europe, we have to recognise that we are much stronger and Europe is also much stronger by us all working together and not just financially. Membership in the EU gives way to many benefits and leaving the European Union would only be detrimental to that prosperity. Our relationship is give and take. Its symbiotic nature is what allows such great progress. This partnership with the EU is necessary in order to solve the challenges that present itself, which are best dealt with working together. Economically, EU membership allows access to a single market with millions of people, numerous opportunities for investment and, increase, and increased competitiveness. Leaving this single market would not be in our best interest. 
3 million jobs, 25,000 companies, 200 billion in exports each year, 450 billion in investments. This is what we would have to show for our ties to Europe. We also must ensure and welcome any changes that may be beneficial to the European Union, the United Kingdom and Scotland. The employment and social aspects in the annual growth survey of 2015, which was put to a vote in the European Parliament last week, failed to gain the necessary support due to the negative votes from Conservative Lib Dems, UKIP MEPs and abstentions from the SNP and Greens. These precarious employment situations, such as zero-hour contracts, affect nearly 1.4 million UK workers. The rights of the workers and supporting the favourable changes that the EU is trying to make for the good of the Member States. It is clear that the benefits from continuing our membership with the European Union are numerous. This close relationship to Europe is essential to both parties and it has undoubtedly crucial to our interest to stay part of this relationship. It was suggested in the Smith Commission that Scotland be allowed to have a greater influence over the UK policy positions in regards to Europe. With this in mind, um, we had the now Cabinet Secretary, um, then former Minister Angela Constance, presented the UK at the EU Education, Youth, Culture and Sport Council in December last year. This direct engagement demonstrates Scotland's voice plays an important role on European issues. Our place in the world is not defined by being a part of Europe, but it's strengthened by it. The key here is keeping the United Kingdom and the EU and improving on it so that we can maximise the progress that we, the UK and the EU, can make together. In conclusion, President Officer, there is no doubt that there are many advantages that the EU membership brings to Scotland, while the future of the United Kingdom undoubtedly lies within EU. We need to be leading the way for an improved European Union rather than threatening to leave it. I believe that the EU should be taking the lead in issues such as tackling exploitative work practices and recognise the need to protect public services in any trade negotiations, as we in the Labour Party want to have these jobs across Europe, not just in Scotland, fair working conditions in Scotland, UK and across Europe, and the Labour Party is the party that backs these measures in the UK. Thank you very much. Now I call on Christian Allard to be followed by Liam MacArthur. President Officer, let me start my contribution to this very timely and very important debate with a 1736 quote found in the diaries of a French minister. René de Voyer is known to have first used uh, in writing the following well-known say. Laissez faire. Laissez faire, or let it be, he wrote, should be the motto of all public powers since the world was civilized. He added that we cannot grow except by lowering our neighbors is a detestable notion. Only malice and malignity of heart is satisfied with such a principle, and our national interest is opposed to it. This motto was also at the essence of Adam Smith's thinking. Not that he supported an economy free from government interference, but that he supported free trade between nations as a condition of the growth of, this, of those nations. Because, presenting officer, laissez faire is only one half of the motto. The other half is laissez passer, the right of free movement, not only of goods, but also, and more importantly, the right of free movement of people which is at the heart of the European project that is the EU. I believe we are where Adam Smith would have liked us, the people of Scotland, to be, at the heart of Europe, free to trade and free to set up businesses and to work across the EU. This is very much needed, and like Dennis Robertson in his intervention said, 
uh, uh, to the Minister, uh, it's important that small and medium businesses uh, are encouraged uh, to go and, and work with the rest of the EU. But similarly, I think it's very, very important that our people are encouraged to go and live and work and participate uh, all across the EU. It's very, very important that we've got that movement of people, not only the movement of goods, not only the movement of trade and businesses, but also people. This is very, very important. It's how the EU is contract. Uh, President, I found plenty malice and malignity of art in the debate about the European Union since I came to Britain. And I was surprised about it. I particularly find detestable the notion that the UK cannot pursue its agenda to grow its own economy without rejoicing at its neighbours' economic failings. This is something you find very, very often on television, in the press, especially the UK media and the London media. Failings are many in the UK, just like in the other EU countries, and the EU is not perfect, the Minister said it in his opening remarks, but I can assure you that this attitude to ridicule other nations in the EU when they have problems has never been reciprocal. To the contrary, I found that people across the EU have great respect for the UK, a respect that some politicians are undermining here regularly. I'm not saying here, I'm not saying in this Parliament, of course. Former French Prime Minister Michel Rocard was one of the first voices uh, worrying about this, and he made it clear that if the UK was so desperate to exit the EU, then the EU might be better without the United Kingdom. Because the truth is that we need our neighbours to do well for us to do well. Instead of blaming the EU for our own Westminster government shortcomings, we need our London-based politicians to change their tune. Our national interest, UK or Scotland, is in direct opposition to this exit from the EU. The so-called Brexit. In France, they call it le Brexit. So famous it is. The former head of the French government made it, his views clear on this point. Uh, the British elite's fear of isolation, he said, that would result could weaken the city. But the English bank is part paralyzing factors today. It is highly more speculative than others. It is a paralysis for real economy. President Officer, this comment is a result of a constant attack on the EU. I don't know if Michel Rocard agrees with the Scottish government double majority proposal, but he made it clear that the problem is political. Uh, in London, not in Scotland, not even with the people of England, and certainly not with the people of Scotland. President Officer, with the many years working in the fishing industry, I, I understand maybe better than most, and the Minister said it again in his opening remark, that the EU is far from perfect. But again, I need to point out that other EU countries have been a lot more successful in negotiating at EU level than the UK has. Uh, for example, I welcome the Scottish Government proposal on fisheries. Yes, we should continue to move away from a centralised approach to fisheries management in favour of greater flexibility and the further delegation of powers to the national and regional level. And Member States should be granted further autonomy in relation uh, to ensure waters, to ensure the survival of Scottish fishing, fishermen's traditional fishing grounds. Uh, and it's not only, only in fishing, but it's also in agriculture and, of course, uh, in, in migration, in migration from outside the, the EU. Uh, we are taking evidence at the Justice Committee just now on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. And I can tell you that the horrific stories that we have of migrants coming from outside the EU will be a lot worse if we were isolated. It will be a lot worse if we were not part of the EU. That free movement of people is so important. President Officer, let me finish with a quote, not from Adam Smith, but from his contemporary, Voltaire. Adam Smith kept a bust of Voltaire in his home. You won't find one in my office. And Voltaire knew what place Scotland is in Europe, was, and uh, when he said, we look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilization. Scotland's place in the European Union is where we are today and what we all are, this EU Migrant, this EU citizen, will be voting for the Scottish Government motion tonight. Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. Hey, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too welcome the debate uh, and thank Hamza Youssef, or as I like to call him, uh, the Minister, 
uh, for allowing Parliament uh, this opportunity. Uh, the motions, the amendments before us, I think are somewhat revealing. Um, the Labour amendment, which I'm happy to confirm we'll be supporting, sets out, I think, very fairly the broad benefits as well as some of the specific areas of strength. It also, I think, rightly identifies the opportunities for improving things going forward, not least through the Smith Commission proposals. I think the SNP uh, motion uh, has much of the, the, the same, and I very much welcome, I think, the conciliatory and reasonable tone that the Minister adopted in his opening remarks, despite some of the siren voices, perhaps, on his back benches that were encouraging him otherwise. Uh, but he can't, the motion can't resist the dog whistle to its base at the end. A little uh, like the Tories themselves, the Jamie, Jamie McGregor's amendment achieves the twin feat of being factually incorrect and ideologically misguided. The UK government does not to demand treaty reform in an in-out referendum. That is the Tory party. The Tories appear to be in a blind spin over UKIP and their long-standing internal divisions over Europe. And as a result, despite Mr McGregor's uh, reassurance, he seemed hell-bent on driving the UK out of an economic, social and political union that has served us well uh, for over four decades. I agree that an in-out referendum is more meaningful than one based on the minutiae of a treaty change. But this policy is a sign of weakness uh, of the Tories and of the Prime Minister, not a sign of strength or indeed of leadership. As I say, the SNP motion is, is fine up to a point. It, it regrettably lapses into playing the independence card towards the end. Let's be clear, the preferred option is not an in-out referendum. Um, there is nothing for business or indeed for safeguarding the hard-fought uh, economic recovery we're now seeing from such a route. But if there is a referendum, we need all the progressive voices to be united in support of keeping the UK, including Scotland, within the, the EU. The one point in Mr McGregor's speech I probably had some sympathy with is I don't recall any suggestion that Orkney or Shetland were being offered a double lock during the referendum campaign or Glasgow or areas of the central belt to drag us out of the UK. And it is, no, I, I, no, 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 thank you. It's too easy to link the SNP's calls for a retreat from the UK to UKIP and the Tory calls for a retreat from Europe. There's a remarkable similarity in the rhetoric about so-called rule from London and rule from Brussels, that the best people to make decisions about what happens in Scotland are the people in Scotland, the best people to make decisions about what happens to the people in the UK are the people in the UK. And the Minister, I know, will refute that charge, and I accept entirely the genuine felt commitment that he has to uh, a pro-European agenda. But it does rather highlight the scale of the task for the SNP in work, having to work all the harder to convince voters that their principal objective, their principal motive, is to keep the UK in the UK and not secretly hope for Brexit so that independence plans can thereafter be dusted down. As I said during the referendum debate, UK exit from the EU is not in the interest even of an independent Scotland. Just ask Scotland's farmers. farmers obviously are not the only ones who benefit from our EU membership and nor are they uh, the only ones to point out with some justification the fact that the EU itself is far from being perfect. But the economic benefits of member membership are plain for all to see. It's the largest single market incorporating two of our most significant trading partners outside the UK in the shape of France and Germany. Scotland, as a high-skill economy with an export focus, has opportunities across a range of sectors, from food and drink through to energy. The benefit from freedom of movement, again, we've seen uh, Scotland profit from this. Many Scots make up the 1.5 million UK cit citizens living and working elsewhere in, in the EU. Myself and my now wife uh, are evidence of that from our time spent in Brussels. And again, this benefits key sectors from our higher education sector, so attractive to others throughout the, UK, uh, the EU to come and study through to our tourism offering. I think the Labour Amendment very fairly points uh, to the, uh, the, 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 the benefits to be derived from initiatives such as Horizon uh, 2020. I think the importance of that to, to industry and academia has well been underscored already, but I think the £2.5 billion secured for SME engagement very much picks up a point that was, uh, that, that was reiterated during the Horizon 2020 event uh, hosted by the Europe Committee here in this Parliament uh, not so long ago. The freedom of movement also illustrates the social dimension to our EU membership, further underscored uh, by the benefits derived from structural funds, a recognition that the EU itself will be undermined if it's seen to benefit only some and not all. And yes, the Highlands and Islands have benefited from Objective 1 uh, status, but I would remind uh, Jamie McGregor that it's a, it's a testament to the success of that that we are no longer eligible to that, as we've seen uh, relative economic growth as a result. 
the single market. It's not just a survival of the fittest. It's always recognised there is a social dimension to that, and we've seen that through workplace reforms over many years, as Claire Baker highlighted. Everything from environmental reform to a cross-border collaboration uh, in, in tackling crime, all of these demonstrate the ability to act collaboratively at an EU level to tackle uh, or meet objectives that cannot be met, met by individual nations alone. And I thought Christine McAlvey was absolutely right in, 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 in drawing attention to the EU's role in being a force uh, for peace. I think as those with the lived experience of the world wars uh, are now dying off, we are at risk of losing sight of this fundamental uh, uh, purpose. The remarkable distance that we've traveled since 1945, or the objectives even in 1958 to use economic integration and binding in Germany's industrial base in coal and steel in such a way as to make war, if not impossible, certainly a good deal more difficult. Something we should never, never underestimate. The risks remain. We we see it in terms of the Balkan conflict, the Russian influence in Ukraine, we are not out of the woods. It's not to say we're not uncritical of the EU. I bear the scars from fisheries councils like Christian Allard. It's guilty of mission creep, a tendency to want to micromanage, and where national interests can often be dressed up as EU-wide interests. We must engage with the EU institutions and partners uh, in the need to improve. The Smith proposals give us a way of doing that by improving the mechanisms at an official and ministerial level within the UK. I think John Swinney and Mike Moore are to be uh, commended on uh, the uh, commitment uh, and the dedication they showed to this particular aspect to close, of Smith. Uh, but we need to be vigilant that that is now delivered in practice. President Officer, can I again welcome the debate, the positive tone uh, of acknowledging the benefits derived from EU and a commitment across the piece to be critical friends where need be uh, and improve the way in which the UK engages uh, with uh, the EU going forward. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I now call on Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Michael McMahon. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Scotland is often described as being on the periphery of Europe, and while this may be true in a geographic sense, our strong cultural, historical and political connection to Europe suggests otherwise. Indeed, it is impossible to understand Scottish culture or the development of our political system without an appreciation of our historic links to other European nations. We need only look at the quint quintessential markers of Scottish nationhood to realise Scotland itself is a product of Europe and our interactions with our European neighbours. Today we have a more formalised relationship with our European neighbours and the legislation we scrutinise in our committees and debate in this chamber are always considered within a European legal context. Clearly Scotland has benefited greatly from its European interactions and I believe that Scotland should continue to build on these connections as a constructive member of the European Union. However, after being instructed that a no vote in last year's referendum was the only way to secure Scotland's participation in the EU, our EU membership and ability to effectively influence European policy is now under threat from the Tory party. David Cameron's commitment to an in-out referendum on our EU membership threatens to undermine decades of European cooperation and the vital economic benefits of a single market that gives Scotland access to 500 million people and 22 million businesses across Europe. It is the threat to Scotland's participation in the single market that I am particularly concerned about. And I believe the removal of our EU membership will seriously undermine Scotland's long-term economic objectives. The EU accounts for nearly half of Scotland's international exports. And in 2011, these European exports supported more than 336,000 jobs in Scotland. It's difficult to understand how our withdrawal from the European single market will improve economic relations with Europe, particularly in light of the 985 million euros investment that Scotland is currently receiving from the European Regional Development Fund and European Social Fund. In reality, the loss of EU membership not only threatens jobs, it undermines investment and our ability to create sustainable growth. Even putting aside economics for a moment, the threat of the UK government's proposed EU referendum is a symptom of a more general rise in hostility against Europe from the Westminster elite. This hostility has also shown itself in the Tory threat to withdraw the UK from the European Court of Human Rights, a move that would place us alongside Belarus as one of the few European states that not to have ratified the Convention on European Human Rights. We have also seen this hostility focused against migrants as the UK government toughens its rhetoric against Europeans wishing to work hard and to build a life here in the UK. It's an unedifying spectacle to see UK parties tacked to the right as a response to the siren calls from UKIP. It's essential, it's essential in my view, that we continue to challenge the UK government's politically motivated and illogical immigration rhetoric. University College London, as mentioned 
by the Minister in his opening speech, found that EU migrants contributed more than £20 billion to the economy between 2001 and 2011. Workers from EU 15 countries, such as France and Germany, contributed 64% more in tax than they received in benefits, while migrants from newer accession states paid 12% more than they received. That, that shoots down the very argument that Jamie McGregor used earlier about people coming here and taking benefits. The figures put a lie to that argument. Yeah, 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 yeah. European migrants make a positive economic, social and cultural contribution to Scotland, and they deserve better than a Westminster political culture that is locked in a race to the bottom on immigration. The clear difference of approach we see at Westminster compared with Holyrood is indicative of the diverging political cultures of the two parliaments. It's becoming increasingly apparent that the UK government does not reflect the views of the people of Scotland, nor does it prioritise the Scottish position on a range of European policy issues. Research undertaken by Durham University and the University of East Anglia concluded that while a majority of constituencies in England would vote to leave the EU, only four seats in Scotland would vote to do likewise. Dr Hanretti of the University of East Anglia said the findings showed that Scottish views on the European Union are distinct from English views. And that, and I want to quote very carefully here, even looking at constituencies just north of the border, areas that are by no means bedrocks of SNP support, you find a more favourable opinion of the EU than you do in the north of England. These findings show why it's essential that Scotland has a democratic safeguard against the threat of the UK government's in-out referendum. I therefore fully support the introduction of a four-nation consent clause as part of any future EU referendum bill to ensure that the voices of the respective UK nations are respected. We were told to vote no to be part of the family of nations. We cannot be a family if one particular member of that family can drag the other three members out of the EU. That is not a family of nations. Scotland cannot be dragged out of Europe against the wishes of the majority of people in Scotland. Presiding officer, I would like to conclude today by reaffirming the importance of the UK's European Union membership. But that ultimately, Scotland's interests would best be served by having our own voice on the European stage. The proposals outlined in the Smith Commission that would see greater Scottish-UK government cooperation and European representation is welcome, but there are still limitations to this approach. I know that I will not be alone in raising concerns about the UK government's ability to accurately re represent our interests on energy policy or fisheries or indeed many other portfolio areas. I look forward to the day when Scotland's voice is heard unimpeded at the top tables of Europe. And given the evidence from recent polling, that day might come sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. I now call on Michael McMahon to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. And can I start by uh, wishing everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day? There are many myths peddled about the EU, as Jamie McGregor uh, said in his speech. But in my experience, they mostly come from people who want Britain to leave. When it comes to assessing a relationship with insti that institution, we should focus on the facts and the positives. So I welcome this afternoon's debate, which allows us to do just that. To begin with, I believe that being a member of arguably the world's biggest marketplace provides huge advantages for both Britain and Scotland. Being able to export goods and services across all of the EU without customs and other barriers is something we cannot afford to lose, as over half of our exports go to the rest of the EU. UK membership gives access to what uh, continues to be a growing single market governed by a single set of regulations that cuts costs and facilitates much greater potential trade. In total, 60% of British trade is with other EU countries, involving 700,000 companies across Britain. Our EU trade provides 3.5 million jobs. So if Britain is not in the EU, it would be on its own in a world of powerful regional trading blocs such as NAFTA. On our own, we'd be isolated and unable to negotiate with the USA and China in the way that only the power of the EU can achieve for us at the moment. These large blocs would have all the advantages of large domestic markets in global trade negotiations, leaving the UK at a comparative disadvantage. The petted-minded uh, Euroscepticism of the current and previous Conservative governments has already put us at a disadvantage when it comes to economic interaction in the wider world. So we should, say, we should stay and influence the future of the EU making it more democratic and increasing benefits for all EU member states and its citizens. 
Most of the progressive legislation we have on workers' rights has come from Europe. By acting in concert, European countries have, to some extent, avoided a race to the bottom on workers' rights. So why would working people want to jeopardise such things as the Working Time Directive, a piece of key health and safety legislation, by leaving the EU? But unfortunately, as Claire Baker said earlier, the SNP has disappointingly refused to support some of those measures. For example, the vote taken last week in the European Parliament aimed at addressing workplace exploitation by restricting and reducing atypical forms of employment. That vote in the European Parliament on the employment and social aspects in the annual growth survey 2015 report failed to gain enough support due to Conservative, Lib Dem and UK MEPs actually voting against it, while Nicola Sturgeon's UK coalition of the SNP, Greens and Plaid Cymru abstained. So Labour was left as the only UK party to support these calls on EU member states to combat precarious employment, such as zero-hour contracts. And this shows once again that Labour are the only party genuinely standing up for workers' rights. The primary among the myths we hear is one which tries to make people believe the EU forces, uh, that the EU forces Britain to adopt laws on human rights that are contrary to British tradition. However, the rulings that these right-wing politicians object to come from the European Court of Human Rights, and that tribunal is not a part of the EU system. It's an institution of the Council of Europe, an honourable British creation that predates the EU. So these aspects also argue, that these sceptics, sorry, also argue that Britain's market is too valuable for the rest of the continent to ignore. And so the British government could negotiate a trade deal that would preserve all the advantages of membership in the single market without any of the political and financial costs. However, this ignores the real politic that while the UK is an important market for the rest of the EU, any free trade agreement would have a price. For example, in exchange for access to the single market, Norway and Switzerland make major contributions to the EU cohesion funds, and they also have to adopt EU standards without having any say in how they are written. Norway's net contribution to the EU budget is actually higher per capita than Britain's. Britain would almost certainly lose its influence in many international forums. By negotiating as one bloc in world trade talks, the European Union gives its members, the EU, UK included, a powerful and united voice to use when speaking to China and the United States. If Britain exits, it loses that. So many of the arguments for retention of Britain's place in the European Union are similar to arguments for retaining Scotland's place in Britain. Just as Scotland's interests are in Britain, Britain's interests are clearly in Europe, and so we should follow that path where our interests lie. And just as Scotland recently voted with practical good sense to remain part of Britain, Britain should determine similarly, based on reality and not myths, to remain part of the EU. Thank you very much. And I now call on John Mason to be followed by Hans Alamalik. I'll just uh, let the Chamber know that there's a modest amount of time available for constructive interventions, should anyone wish to make them. Uh, Mr Mason, six minutes or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll have to judge whether the, any uh, interventions are going to be constructive or not. Um, my first uh, vote as an 18-year-old was in June 1975 uh, on uh, EU membership, uh, and I seem to remember definitely voting for uh, being in the EU. I see the Europe as a family of nations, and we are part of that family. And I think it would be very strange to be in Europe but not in the European Union, which is the situation that Norway finds itself in, uh, being bound by many of the decisions, uh, but with no real voice, as Mr McMahon uh, was describing. Uh, and let's remember, as I think Liam MacArthur put quite well, how uh, successful the EU has been in one of its core objectives, which was to prevent further wars in Europe which had been part of all our ancestors' lives for many centuries. One of the problems the UK has when it comes to deciding any constitutional issue is that the UK does not have a constitution, at least no constitution in the sense that growing up democratic countries virtually all have written constitutions, which would include provision for changing the constitution 
and for making major decisions such as entering or leaving the EU. Now, far be it from me to criticise the wonderful UK, but at least in this regard, it does contain a major flaw. Mind you, having mentioned one major constitutional flaw in the UK, another one immediately comes to mind, the House of Lords. Now, we are quite used to saying it's undemocratic, as if that was normal, but again, for other modern democratic countries, and certainly European countries, having one chamber unelected would be anathema. And why is that relevant here today? Because there is no democratic check on the House of Commons. The government motion today proposes that each of the four parts of the UK should have to vote no to the EU before we could leave. Now, a similar result, I think, would be achieved if the UK had a second chamber which was elected and which consisted of 25% for England, 25% for Scotland, 25% for Wales and 25% for Northern Ireland. Then a 75% majority for such a major constitutional change would provide a democratic break on any English government. Speaking personally, I have spent uh, two years of my life living in London and three years in Nepal. And in both of these places, I worked in two separate international charities. I worked with many different European uh, people, as well as folk from outside Europe. And I have to say that of all the nationalities I've worked with that I feel most close to, uh, it would be the Dutch, uh, despite the fact, I have to say, I do not have any of their language. But Scotland has a huge amount in common with the Netherlands and with other countries for that sake, but at least uh, are both being relatively small countries. We both have a strong maritime history. We both have a similar religious mix of Reformed and Catholic churches. And again, as has been said, I think Mr McMahon put it, uh, that if we are to compete on the world stage with the large countries we face today, like the United States, China, Russia, India and others, the UK is really too small. We need to work together as a European family. Another reason the UK is too small is for our export industries, whiskey, food and drink, specialist engineering. 64 million is too small a market to grow companies for the world stage. The EU itself has a market of some 500 million, and through it we get better trade agreements for selling worldwide. Now, some people would say we have failed to grow companies which are based in Scotland, and we have failed to keep key sectors in public ownership. But I ask myself, is that a fault of the EU or is that a fault of the UK? I would suggest that in both of these cases, the fault lies with the UK. In fact, other EU countries have not privatised rail, electricity and so on, and have also been much better at keeping local companies local, as with manufacturing in Germany. So if you were to ask me, are our businesses and jobs safer in the EU or in the UK, it seems clear to me that the UK is the bigger risk with their desire to sell anything for a quick buck, whereas several other European countries are better at taking a long-term view and investing for the future. Another strength of the EU has been its confederalist approach, with subsidiarity lying at the heart of decision-making. This contrasts with the UK, which has had a very centralist approach, only conceding the minimum of devolution and only very reluctantly when forced to do so. Yes, absolutely. Ian MacArthur. Mason for taking an intervention will try to be as constructive as, as possible. I'm interested in the point um, he makes there about um, the, the similarity across our European partners. But do you not agree that um, France, for example, is one of the most centralised um, societies uh, and economies in the European Union and, in fact, has been a driver of much of what's happened at an EU level? John Mason. Um, I certainly do agree that, uh, from my knowledge of France, it is uh, very centralised. I think I'm arguing probably more for the EU as, a, as one institution rather than the individual constituent parts of it, but I, I do uh, take his point, and I was just going to mention one or two more things. For example, as Michael McMahon's already mentioned, the EU has often taken a more progressive approach than the UK has uh, on issues of concern to Scotland, like the Working Time Directive, like financial regulation and caps and bankers' bonuses, and, for that matter, on immigration where Scotland, frankly, is short of people and we need more people in order to grow our economy. Small countries are also uh, respected, uh, go back to Liam MacArthur's point, more in the EU than I would say they are in the UK. For example, smaller countries get proportionally more MEPs in order to counterbalance the big countries. Thus, in Germany, France, UK, Italy and Spain, it takes over 800,000 people to get one MEP, but in Denmark, Ireland, Austria and Finland, it is under 500,000. And that, I think that's the kind of practical arrangement which uh, Christina McKelvey mentioned, uh, where the UK is so much better than, sorry, the EU is so much better than the UK. They take into account both the population and recognition of the importance of the individual state, 
which in fact the US does that as well. But in the UK this does not happen and we have this very rigid legalistic approach we're insisting that every MP should represent the same number of registered voters. But if we followed the European model, Scotland would have more MEPs at, MPs at Westminster. And there are many other examples of how small countries in the EU can punch above their weight and can club together to counteract the bigger countries. So I think we can see clearly that smaller countries feel safer in the EU and see the EU as a good protection against traditionally predatory larger neighbours in the same way Scotland there can feel safer. So, presiding officer, I am Scottish first, but I am certainly European second. I am very happy to be both, and I want it to continue that way. Thank you. Many thanks. <laughs> now, call on Hansala Malik to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, presiding officer. I am pleased to be taking part in today's debate on Scotland's place in, within Europe. I have always seen the advantages of Scotland within the United Kingdom as part of the European Union. The European Union single market allows for each easy access to trade, education, and support developing our economic economy and society. The European Union, I believe, is an ex exceptional partnership in developing and development. And with the proper relationship, our partnership with Europe can assist with many issues that face us in our nation today. However, there is a lack of strategy in improving Scotland's ability to draw funds to the third sector, developing infrastructure or supporting industry. I strongly encourage it. In fact, I demand that the Scottish Government takes a strong role in guiding and supporting our third sector and private industry to apply for European funding in future. I have brought up this issue of the need for better access to European support and grants at the European and External Relations Committee. But I have yet to see real progress from the Scottish Government on this issue. Our relationship with Europe is not without its issues. Scottish universities have raised concerns over the planned diversification of 2.7 billion euros for the horizon 2020. The European Union's main research fund to a new European stimulus funding officially called the European Fund for Strategic Investment, in short, EFSI. Scotland and other UK, United Kingdom research institutes, institutes have benefited a great deal from this fund and the resulting grants from the European Fund Council. I would like to ask that what discussions the Cabinet Secretary or, for that matter, um, the Minister Hamza Youssef has had with his UK colleagues to contract, counteract this near, uh, nearsighted uh, decision that the European Union is hoping to make or intending to make. As I have said, I generally support Scotland's membership of the European Union through the UK, and I wish to see this relationship develop further. But, presiding officer, we in Scotland have seen many organizations either don't apply or have failed to get European Union funding. And once again, I will call upon the Scottish Government to identify officials, organizations, or even agencies who can guide and help the third sector and our private industry through this maze of acquiring funding rightfully uh, their right to apply for and gain for. And I look forward to uh, the Minister commenting on this issue. I have to say that consistently uh, there has been an understand in this area in the European Union and consistently we in Scotland have missed our opportunities in getting our fair share of funding. What is now concerning me 
is the European Union's concentration in new members that are uh, up and coming within Europe and giving them opportunities. But what worries me and, and uh, uh, I have concerns about it is the organizations and communities that have not actually got any funding in Scotland during that period of time. History can be very cruel, but history can also be very kind. It can be kind if we have been able to uh, consistently apply and utilize the opportunities that Europe had offered us, but it's cruel that we've not been able to do so and hope that we can find ways of redressing that. One of the biggest issues that I feel that we have missed out opportunities in the past is our infrastructure and our communication sector. I think that the fact that most of Scotland is rural, many people could benefit from good communications and good infrastructure facilities, um, and Europe could have helped us in that fact. The fact the European Union has reduced their budgets in the internet facilities as well is also damaging. So I will be very interesting, interested to hear from the Mr. Minister today how he can find ways to help us organize potential um, support for the third sector. I think it's absolutely crucial in a shrinking uh, resource uh, scenario in, in Scotland. Coming from Glasgow, many of my constituents come on a daily basis to me complaining that funding has been reduced or even stopped in many instances. And I think that we have lost opportunities in the past. I hope we will not lose them in the future. And uh, I'm more than happy to support the minister in this bid to try and redress this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I now call on Willie Coffey to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thanks very much, uh, President Officer. Um, as my colleague Stuart Maxwell said in his opening remarks, Scotland may well be on the fringes of, of Europe geographically, but in terms of our natural resources and what we bring to the table, Scotland is very much at the heart of Europe. Uh, we're a small country with about 1% of the population of the European Union, but we bring to the table huge resources in terms of fishing, renewable energy potential, world-class product, products in food and drink, and a contribution well beyond our size in science, medicine and innovation. Scotland pulled out of Europe against our will would be as much of a disaster for our European friends as it would be for us. And the scandalous thing about this prospect is that none of it is Scotland's doing. It has all come about because of the failure of England's political parties to persuade ordinary people in that country that the European ideal brings greater benefits than drawbacks. It has come about because that failure has allowed extreme elements to fill the credibility gap, fuelled by a hysterically anti-European media, all too ready to peddle the message on behalf of those extremists. And it has come about because those parties feel compelled to appease this anti-European agenda rather than taking it on and exposing it for what it is. It's not acceptable for a Prime Minister to talk up the idea of a family of nations one minute, then tell us we will all do what England decides in Europe the next. In that context, President Officer, how on earth can any Scottish parliamentarian support Scotland being pulled from the heart of Europe on the back of such a negative and regressive political agenda elsewhere? Scottish MPs and MP Scottish MSPs and MPs of all parties must stand up for Scotland if Scotland decides to stay in the European Union and if England decides to leave. That scenario, President Officer, can only happen, though, if the Tories get back into power because Labour can't defeat them, even by aping them as best they can, sticking to the same spending plans and voting with them to cut another £30 billion off public spending. The real test under this scenario would come if the Tories do form the next government and then fail to get the changes they claim they want Europe to agree to. Under those circumstances, I think the prospects of the UK government recommending leaving Europe would be very real and the consequences of this for Scotland would be dire. Membership of the European Union gives Scotland direct access to a huge market of 500 million citizens, as has been mentioned by one or two of the members the world's biggest economy with over 20 million businesses, over 300,000 jobs in Scotland are associated with exports to the EU and it accounts for nearly half of our international exports. Over 150,000 citizens from other member states 
live, work and study here, as do many thousands of Scots throughout Europe. Most of this would be thrown into chaos and the consequent damaging effect on jobs and Scotland's economy could be catastrophic. President officer, many of those who have given evidence at our European Committee and from across Europe too have said their clear hope is that the UK does not leave Europe. Uh, none more so perhaps than, than in Ireland who, as Michael McMahon said, celebrates St Patrick's Day. So Laela Porig Sonajeev is happy St Patrick's Day to, to everybody. Whose Taoiseach Enda Kenny has spoken publicly of his hope that the UK remains in Europe but he has nevertheless recently set up a new department specifically looking at the issues arising for Ireland from a possible UK exit. Clearly on the negative side there would be border control issues to resolve, but some look too to the fact that over 250 foreign banks with their European bases in London eh, might consider moving to Dublin or of course to Scotland under different circumstances. Some view that as a positive outcome of a UK exit, but on balance, the Irish hope is very much that the UK stays in Europe. In terms of uh, Mr Juncker's 10-point strategy for Europe, I suppose it is technically possible that the UK could operate out with these key strategic priorities, but it's really hard to see how a UK out of Europe could develop alternative and possibly competing strategies on things like the digital single market or the 315 billion euro investment plan. And who knows, the, the UK might end up with its own brand of TTIP, a kind of UK TTIP. None of this is impossible, but it's unlikely that any positive impacts achieved by an isolated UK would have anything like the scale of success from a pan-European approach to some of these matters. One thing, though, I'm certain of, presiding officer, and that is Europe needs to connect with its citizens in a more direct, simple and easy-to-understand way than it does at the moment. Eurobabble is a language that is hard for ordinary people to understand, and the quicker Europe realises this and does something about it, the better. If you look at the European Union and the Commission's public-facing websites, you would be forgiven for thinking they were designed by officials for the amusement of academics. They need to simplify their communication methods with the public and make Europe easier to understand for citizens, showcasing the many positive stories that there are to tell. President officer, finally, there, there should, should there ultimately be an in-out referendum on Europe where England votes to leave and Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland votes to stay in, then the UK must respect the mandates in this so-called family of nations and stay in. Any move to force Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland out of Europe against the wishes and best interests of their people will inevitably trigger a constitutional crisis more serious than the membership of the European Union itself. At that point, presiding officer, the will of the Scottish people will be the sole determinant of our own future. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, like others, I campaigned in the 1975 uh, referendum that Harold Wilson had to solve internal political difficulties in the Labour Party, the party of government, um, that uh, resulted in a, a yes vote. My party uh, took a position against because of the sellout of the fishing industry, but for my part, uh, I was always firmly on the yes side and voted accordingly doing so with a heavy heart, knowing I was disagreeing with my party. But of course, 1975 wasn't the start of the story. The UK joined uh, the then Euro European Economic Community in 1973 uh, under a Tory Prime Minister. But things go somewhat further back than that. It was a UK Member of Parliament who had been a prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials, who was the moving spirit behind the European Convention on Human Rights, and Winston Churchill uh, was the Prime Minister that took uh, the UK into that and was a proud signatory of the Convention when it came into operation on the 3rd of September 1953. But of course it goes further back than that as well. In that in 1320, uh, when Scotland sought to protect its independence, it was to the Pope in Rome 
that Scotland wrote, because the Pope was not simply a, 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 a head of a church. He had a secular and key role in coordinating international relationships. So Scotland is no stranger uh, to Europe. Scotland has no uh, distant connection to Europe. It's always had a very intimate connection. Jamie McGregor uh, and others derided the idea of four-nation consent and, among other things, said, of course, it would be inconceivable uh, that different parts of the UK uh, went different ways. But, of course, that is to um, neglect what has already happened. In 1982, Greenland, uh, uh, an autonomous country within Denmark, voted to leave the EU and by 1985 successfully did so, despite having that relationship. I don't commend that because I would wish to stay, but their choice was to go. So it is entirely possible by that example uh, for different decisions and different effects, uh, even within one single existing uh, member. Uh, the, 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 Jamie also, in his approach, uh, seemed to imply that Spain should withdraw uh, access to benefits for the nearly one million UK citizens who live uh, in that country. Reference has been made uh, to Norway and Switzerland, and for a while, uh, one of my nieces lived in Norway and commuted daily to Sweden to work, I may say, uh, never showing a passport or anything else, which I thought was quite interesting at a European boundary. Uh, but certainly there is increasing disquiet in Norway at, first of all, the economic contribution they require to make to the European Union as a price for being in the e European economic area, but also at their having uh, to be bound by the rules of the European Union while having no say in how they work. Um, we, we heard someone say that France is substantially uh, more centralised than the UK, um, I think this will come as a very great surprise to uh, many people in France. Uh, the satirical novel by Gabriel Chevalier of 1934, Cloche Merrill, which was a very successful TV series in 1972, was all about the local mayor um, wanting to build the new, and do forgive me, this is literally what he said, a new pissoir in the town square. Um, and uh, to this day, there is considerable local authority in the towns and villages of France, and indeed in the real life cloche, Merle Vaux Beaujolais, uh, the, the mayor is there every Thursday for two hours while she takes her lunch and eats her sandwiches in this tiny little village she is there. France is far less uh, a centralized country uh, than one might uh, imagine if you listen to some people in this debate. Turning to uh, uh, the amendments that are before us, uh, the Labour Party's amendment, uh, in, in, in the most part, I could find myself uh, relatively comfortable with, but it does fail to understand the reality of the UK's engagement with the European Union when it says, believe, at the end, the UK should lead as a strong member of the EU. The one thing the UK is not is a strong member of the EU. The UK has never, to this day, properly engaged with the internal workings of the EU. The Irish, the moment they got in in 73, sent their people across there. They got into the grassroots. They were involved in the very early stages of formulating European policy. The UK has always waited until the policy has been formed before saying, this when they do and we've got to change it, by which time it is too late. If the UK had engaged in a proper way, I suspect the EU uh, would be one um, that uh, would operate in a way which would satisfy even many uh, of Jamie McGregor's colleagues who are less sympathetic to the idea of the EU leaving aside its operation uh, than he is. In conclusion, presiding officer, I, I was interested to hear that the Tories are essentially saying, uh, let the people speak. Um, the European Convention on Human Rights Protocol 1, Article 3 about elections means you have to have democracy. The UK has a majority of its legislators unelected. We're in breach of that. I'd love to have a referendum in the House of Lords. I suspect I know how it would turn out. Maybe that's why the Tories won't have one. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by Roderick Campbell.
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, one of the founding principles of the European Union back in its early days as a coal and steel community was a commitment to the equalisation and improvement of the living conditions of workers. And while Europe can often seem distant from our daily lives, the reality is that we, that we have the European Union to thank for many of the rights and freedoms that we enjoy every day, from paid holidays for all to equal pay for women, from equal rights for part-time workers to maternity rights from day one and statutory maternity leave for up to a year from safer workplaces and action to tackle working hours. Real benefits and make real difference every day. We've got a single market that allows Scottish businesses access to 500 million people with one set of rules and issues of common concern rather than 28 sets of rules. Allo allowing Scots to live, study or work anywhere in the EU. A union that's helped keep the peace in Europe for 70 years. Yet while well, Europe makes a real difference to our lives, Turnout at European elections is low, as Claire Baker has already highlighted. And right across Europe, there's a growing disenchantment with European institutions, which often appear to put markets before people and simply seem remote and detached from the lives that people lead. However, in the UK, despite the best efforts of some of the tabloid press, support for remaining in the EU is now on the increase and, according to YouGov, has risen steadily since 2012, particularly amongst women and voters in Scotland and in London. So this is an encouraging sign for those of us who believe Scotland's role is at the heart of Europe. Scottish Labour's amendment today calls in for the EU to focus on tackling inequality and exploitative working practices and it highlights how important it is to focus on measures to protect our public services and trade negotiations and this is particularly topical in respect of the current debate around TTIP. If the European vision is to prosper, it must be about offering hope and opportunities for its citizens, about ensuring that globalisation works for working people and about guaranteeing that alongside jobs there are decent rights. No. Um, no thanks. One of the most pressing challenges we face, not just in Scotland but across the EU, is equal pay and the continued gender pay gap, which means that on average in Europe, women are paid 16.2% less than men. Yet in a recent debate on promoting greater equality, which included a green action to reduce the pay gap and, combat and, and also to combat violence against women and promote paid paternity leave, the UK's Tory MEPs voted against taking action, revealing once more that when it comes to making life fairer for working people in the UK, the Tories choose not to act. And this is obviously no surprise from a party that chooses to offer tax breaks to millionaires and to ignore tax avoidance, but ordinary families up and down the length of the UK pay the price of austerity. Scottish Labour knows that we only succeed in Scotland when working families succeed, and we can't rebuild our economy based on low wages, temporary and insecure work. The Tories' actions, both in Europe and at home, show exactly why Scottish families cannot afford another Tory government. And that's what we'll get if the SNP have their way and the Tories are the largest party in May. But it's not just Tory MEPs that are letting down hard-working families in Europe. One of the biggest issues facing the UK is tax evasion, and tackling this is one of Scottish Labour's top priorities. Tax evasion costs European governments €1 trillion Euros a year, €2,000 for each and every one of us, more than the budget deficits of all member states combined, more than Europe spends on health care each year, four times what we spend on education. Yet in a vote in the European Parliament, SNP MEPs joined with UKIP and the Tories and refused to support action for, to fight tax evasion, tax fraud and aggressive tax avoidance. And while zero-hour contracts are an increasing problem right across Scotland, leaving more and more families unable to plan from one week to the next, as Michael McMahon has hi highlighted already, rather than vote to take action, SNP MEPs in Europe again sat on their hands and abstained, leaving Labour... OK. Minister. Through the roll call of uh, MEPs that voted on the amendment she's talking about, does she know that David Martin voted against it? Um, David Martin did make an error and this was corrected. But the SNP's made it, the SNP members made a conscious decision not Order, to sign up please. to action on exploiting zero contracts. Considering this mirrors the position that the SNP MSPs took in the Parliament today, I'm quite astounded that the Minister has raised that issue at all. So well, the SNP MEPs in Europe sat on their hands and abstained, leaving Labour as the only UK party to support calls on EU member states to combat Euro zero hours contracts. So we hear a lot of hate, uh, hot air in this place about the SNP about being inside of working people. But time and time again, they sit on their hands and make excuses rather than take action to improve the lives of hard-working families. The message is clear. There's only one party that will stand up for workers' rights, and that's the Labour Party. We won't abstain when it comes to taking action for working people. One area which Europe must focus more on is tackling child poverty. And the upcoming reforms in the EU give us the opportunity to push 
children and their rights up to the top of the European political agenda. A recent Save the Children report highlights the fact that the number of children at risk of poverty and social exclusion in Europe has risen by almost 1 million in recent years to a staggering 27 million children. Poverty that doesn't just leave children hungry or cold, but which robs them of their dreams, their hopes and their rights, as enshrined in the UN, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and the UN Rights of the Child. So much more needs to be done by every single member state to put children's rights at the centre of the European Union's work and to fight the unacceptable reality of child poverty right across Europe. In conclusion, presiding officer, the best future for the UK is within the European Union, but we need to work to reform the EU to make it more relevant to people's lives. We need to ensure that where there is an opportunity to take action at European level to protect and enhance the rights of Scottish families, that we do so. People need to see the difference that being a member of the EU makes every day, and Europe's future will only be secure if we put the fight for social justice back at its heart. In Europe, like here in the UK, we achieve more than together than we do apart, and we must do all we can to ensure that Scotland and the UK are at the heart of Europe, shaping its future, rather than retreating into the narrow, narrow nasty isolationism and often blatant racism being promoted by UKIP. Thank you. I now call Roderick Campbell to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This debate occurs against the backdrop of a UK general election and with Eurosceptic parties on the rise elsewhere in the UK and to a lesser extent in Scotland. Uh, and we see the political narrative becoming ever more insular and insular, isolationist in those terms, and Willie Coffey has referred to that earlier on. But research conducted by YouGov in August 2014 and referred to in the renowned think tank Chat Chatham House's report published in January showed that voters in Scotland would vote to stay in the EU. The only other area in the UK that would vote to stay in in that survey was London. That survey also found that Scottish voters are more pro-European, more supportive of de overseas development, and more likely than English voters to say ethics should play a role in foreign policy. Chatham House concluded that heightened scrutiny over the position of an independent Scotland within the EU during the referendum period may have driven Scottish voters to consider the value of EU membership and resulted in a move to a more pro-EU viewpoint. According to the research, the Scottish public has largely positive associations regarding the benefits of EU membership, protection of citizens' rights and peace and security, and whilst the negative associations of bureaucracy and the loss of power, with a perhaps a very mixed position on the question of freedom of movement and limitations on that. Results from that survey showed that Scots would vote to remain in the UK by a two-to-one margin. 59% of Scots said they would vote to stay, with only 24% indicating they would vote to leave and while the rest of the UK would albeit narrowly vote to leave the UK. And I know that there is other um, more recent polling evidence suggesting a, uh, a more tight situation, um, but I think it's accepted by at least most commentators that at the very least Scotland is less Eurosceptic than the rest of the UK. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate uh, Roger Campbell taking intervention. To be aware of the survey carried out by the BBC Scotland last week in relation to attitudes towards immigration. Now, there's not a direct read across, of course, but the similarities between the attitudes of immigration north of the border and south of the border were remarkably um, uh, similar, and, and therefore I think give the light perhaps to more to things that Stuart uh, Maxwell was saying than Roger Campbell, but don't indicate the sort of divergence that he's alluding to there. Roger Campbell. I, I think, obviously, different polls produce different things, but I think that, that particular poll has been criticised by some people in terms of uh, the definition of what was meant by immigration. Yeah, but uh, we'll keep that debate for another time. Uh, it's certainly not beyond the, bell, the realms of possibility that the rest of the UK would vote to leave the UK and Scotland would vote to stay. It would be indefensible, in my view, to be taken out of... Europe against our wishes, and to reassure my colleague uh, Liam McCarthy, uh, I'm not aware of anyone in the SNP who somehow believes or secretly wants a British exit from the European Union. And should a bill be tabled on an EU referendum, then I think it's right and proper that a simple amendment requiring all four constituent nations to vote for withdrawal be placed in play. We need proper protection against any constituent nations being removed from the EU against their will. Um, have we said, and many speakers have referred to that already today, that during the referendum campaign, many unionist campaigners talked about a family of nations. But it can't be a family of nations if you can be taken out of a, another union against your will. It's not just the SNP who believe that. Such a proposal was also uh, commended by Carwin Jones, who agreed that the proposal was worth considering, and warned that if the UK leaves the EU on the basis of English votes, it would trigger a constitutional crisis, the likes of which we haven't seen. 
We cannot risk our place in the EU by pandering to those who would take us out against our will. And whilst I appreciate the EU is not perfect and its institutions must reconnect with citizens across the EU, I believe we can achieve reform and improve EU policy without changing the treaties. The emphasis must be on reform, and it's important to note here that the UK Government's own balance of competences review has shown to date very little progress on the issue of uh, re repatriating competences from the EU to national governments. If anything, it's illustrated how the UK has benefited from the current situation. So it rather at odds with the Conservatives' intention to use the findings as a basis to renegotiate the terms of the UK's membership of the EU. In my view, membership of the EU is vital to securing Scotland's interests. It provides the best international framework for Scotland, and we can benefit from the world's largest economic and trading area, which is capable of competing with the most advanced economies in the world. With access to a market of 500 million people and 22 million businesses across the EU, approximately 336,000 jobs in Scotland being dependent on exports to the EU. To withdraw would be disastrous for our economy and would put jobs at risk. However, it's not just the SNP who recognise the risks of leaving the EU and indeed the downside of a referendum. Vince Cable, a, a Liberal Democrat colleague of uh, Mr MacArthur, said, quote, the prospect of a referendum and possible exit from the EU is deeply unsettling for businesses trading in the European single market, from the car industry to financial services. I couldn't agree more. To ensure that Britain trades successfully in the modern world, it must stay in the EU. It's clear that the UK and Scotland would not be taken seriously by either the Americans or the Chinese if we were isolated from our European neighbours. Indeed, Steve Odell, Chief Executive of Ford Europe, said, I would strongly advise against leaving the EU for business purposes and for employment purposes in the EU. But the EU is not simply a trade association. It, it strengthens peace, security, justice and prosperity across Europe. And we're enriched by the free movement of peoples across the EU. EU migrants have made a positive contribution to the UK, both in economic and cultural terms, and the negative rhetoric on EU migration is hugely concerning, particularly as the indications are that migrants coming to our country to work contribute far more to the country than they take out, as indeed Mr Maxwell has referred to earlier on. Presiding officer, we need to ensure that Scotland's voice is heard within the EU, and we're pushing with others to ensure that any economic benefits from TTIP cannot be at the expense of our NHS or indeed other public services. That's why the SNP is pushing for a double lock to be enshrined in TTIP, which will explicitly exempt the NHS from its scope and respect the devolved responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament. Finally, the Smith Commission states that the UK Government, quote, recognise the need to, to reflect fully the views of the other devolved administrations when drawing up any revised governance arrangements in relation to Scottish Government representation of the UK to the EU. What that means in practice, we don't yet know. The devil will be in the detail, but I think we should follow that legislation as it passes through the Westminster Parliament with interest. In conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland's interests are best served by being in, not out of the EU. Thank you. And I now call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Presiding officer, Europe is complex. And I wonder sometimes if the complexity of Europe in itself, in people's minds, means that when it comes to the election for our MEPs, people stay at home. And the referendum with an 85% turnout of people uh, going to the polls because they were energised, they were excited, they had something that they believed that they could take part in. Europe for many seems to be somewhere else. And that's a strange thing because we are European. But is this sort of, I, I think it's an attitude that, that, that's happened, uh, that's grown up within the UK, that UK is a standalone within Europe. And I think that's something we need to try and shift. As a member of the European states, we are extremely fortunate because apart from the economic advantages, which have been mentioned uh, by many members, it's the cultural aspect that also interests me. When we look at the migrants that are coming into our country and into our schools, into our universities, we're actually seeing, especially from our younger people, this embracement of Europe in its wider context. I smiled when Murdo Fraser, um, a few weeks ago, said at committee, who in this modern day speaks French, well, apart from Monsieur Allard and the French and many other people, there's a lot of children in the playgrounds speaking French, speaking German, speaking Spanish. 
And when we look at that cultural embracement of our languages, I actually feel quite embarrassed myself because I struggle with English. There weren't many any other language. And when John Mason, uh, my colleague, said that, you know, he, he has this love of uh, the Dutch but fails to be able to speak the language, is that not something that maybe happened within the UK, the Scots? Maybe have we not embraced this ability to go and speak for, uh, different languages? And this is something we need to try and push forward because if we are to be successful, and I believe that we are successful to some degree, but if we are to be successful and take our export market, this internationalization of our products to the European market, we need to engage and to be able to speak the language of Europe. Would you like to take an intervention? I certainly will. Stuart Stevenson. Ein Schiff op het strand is ein beacon waar am zee. That's a bit of Dutch, a Dutch saying uh, that a ship that's stranded on the beach is a warning to the sailor. And perhaps that's exactly the Dutch in their language capturing the position that the UK will be in. If the UK leaves, that will warn everyone else of the dangers and promote cohesiveness in the EU. Dennis Robertson. I always appreciate interventions from my friend and colleague, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, presiding officer, uh, the, the opportunities are there for us to embrace Europe in this cultural aspect, to ensure that our young people uh, take forward the opportunities before them. At the moment, we quite often hear about the oil and gas industry, and especially within the northeast of Scotland. And some people say the crisis. There is no crisis. The problem we have within the industry is we're going to have a skill shortage, a skill shortage which could actually impact on the industry and its future. But if we have our young people embracing this aspect of migration and people, this movement, this free movement we have at the moment, we can actually be very successful. Our fishing industry relies quite heavily on people coming from other countries. And here, poor lowly Ross, Ross County in the, in, in, the, uh, in the football sense, presiding officer, has brought many Spanish people to Inverness to follow their goalkeeper, who seems to be keeping Ross County away from the relegation zone. Just. But presiding officer, I think when we're looking at this uh, opportunity for Scotland within Europe, and you know, Scotland remains part of the UK. We need to ensure that when we are engaging in Europe and within the Parliament in Europe, that the voice of Scotland is heard and the knowledge and the expertise of Scotland is heard within that sector. When Richard Lockhead goes to Europe, it is his voice, his knowledge, his expertise that we should be listening to when it comes to fishing and agriculture. He is a person that, has, that knows the industry, and I believe it would be respected within Europe. It is time for us to recognise the importance of our ministers in this parliament within the European sector at the top table. The UK government need to look at who has the knowledge and who can best serve, not just Scotland, but the UK when it comes to negotiations. Presiding officer, I'm proud to be a Scot. I'm proud to be a European. I'm proud of the fact that we embrace people from all parts of the world, but certainly within Europe. What I'm delighted about, I'm delighted about the fact that I love Italian cuisine. I love French cuisine. Monsieur Allard himself makes a wonderful beef bourguignon. He is yet to bring it to my table. <laughs> But, presiding officer, we, we have a wonderful, uh, I think, a aspect uh, that we can embrace within Europe. And it's a culture that we should embrace. And when it comes to the European elections, we should be saying to our people, when we knock on the doors, this is your opportunity to have your voice heard again. Because it is important, we should not get back into the situation that we sit in our hands when it comes to elections. I am looking forward to the general election, where I believe the Scottish voice uh, can be heard within the UK Parliament, perhaps to influence our direction within Europe. I sincerely hope that is the case. But let's put one myth to, to rest, presiding officer. The myth is that we are European. 
And when Jimmy McGregor says that the SNP are, are, have many myths around uh, uh, our, our, um, um, uh, our situation within Europe, he's misled, he's misinformed. We are European and we will remain in Europe because unlike Jamie McGregor, I'm not sure that Mr Cameron will be Prime Minister after the general election. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Um, I call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Since the United Kingdom joined in 1973, our place in the European Union, or the European Economic Community as it was known then, has been a topic of political debate across the country. There are many views on this, but I believe that Scotland has clearly benefited from being part of the EU and will continue to do so in the future. I want to focus today on the benefits the EU membership can bring to Scotland and to the influence that Scotland can have on the future direction of the EU. The EU is hugely important to Scotland's economy. 40% of foreign direct investment into Scotland comes from firms based in EU member states. In the other direction, the EU is where nearly 50% of Scotland's international exports go. Hundreds of thousands of jobs in Scotland are directly and indirectly reliant on us being part of the EU. EU competition law ensures a level playing field for our businesses when operating on the continent. The European Regional Development Fund and European Social Fund deliver around £700 million in funding to Scotland. Tens of millions of this will be spent in social projects and economic development in Fife helping people there back to work, enhancing our economic competitiveness, developing our environment and resource efficiency, all whilst improving social inclusion. Take, for example, West Fife Enterprises. The organisation was set up in the wake of the closure of coal mines across West Fife. One of the key local leaders in getting it established at the time was councillor, later to become MSP, Helen Eady. The organisation has worked hard for nearly 30 years to help people in Fife improve their life and work opportunities. It works closely with over 200 companies that operate in Fife, shaping the vocational training that West Fife Enterprise pr provides. This approach not only helps people who need support in gaining new skills and jobs, but also helps local companies find new employees with the skills and knowledge that they need to grow their businesses. West Fife has received nearly £2 million from the European Social Fund and the European Regional Development Fund for a number of projects in the last 10 years or so. With direct support for this and many other projects, as well as the indirect economic benefits of being part of the European Union, it is abundantly clear that our continued membership of the EU is good for Fife. The same can be said for any part of the country, whether it be the East End of Glasgow, which receives millions from the Social Fund and Regional Development Fund each year, or the Financial District of Edinburgh, which benefits from the free movement of goods and services within the EU. The economic benefits extend beyond the EU's borders. The European Union has negotiated trade agreements with countries all over the world. It gives us a stronger voice on the international economic stage. As in 2010, the 27 member states of the EU accounted for over a quarter of global GDP. But the benefits are not purely economic. Over 150,000 EU citizens are resident in Scotland. Citizens of other EU member states enrich Scotland and add to our multicultural society. Students from the EU make our colleges and universities even better, and Scottish students benefit from being part of exchange schemes like Erasmus, where they can experience new learning environments and different cultures. Tens of thousands of Scottish people live in other EU countries, encountering new cultures and picking up skills and expertise that they bring back home. We all benefit from that. Our beaches are maintained to standards set by the EU. We benefit from Europe-wide standards on consumer protection. In Fife and across Scotland, we have untold numbers of farmers and rural workers who benefit from the common agricultural policy and the open market across the entire continent for their produce. We work together across Europe on climate change. The EU provides important protections to workers guaranteeing employee protection not just for Scottish and British workers, but those in countries with far less advanced working, worker protection schemes across the continent. Recently, the EU capped charges for the use of mobile phones when roaming across the EU. The European Parliament hopes to soon go further and ab abolish the charges outright. Similarly, the European Parliament recently voted in favour of capping credit and debit card transaction fees, 
a move which has saved British businesses nearly half a billion pounds a year. On these and hundreds of other similar issues, being part of the European Union makes business and ordinary people's lives easier. We are part of the European Arrest Warrant. According to the European Commission, prior to the European Arrest Warrant's introduction, extradition procedures too, on average, took on average one year to complete. That's now been cut to an average of 48 days. This, alongside a multitude of arrangements designed to maximise cross-border cooperation on policing, means that Police Scotland and the Crown Office are able to investigate crimes more easily and prosecute them more effectively. We're able to cooperate on transnational issues like human trafficking with ease. That's not to say the EU has no flaws. There is a constant need for reform and refinement. But it's not good enough to seek to leave an enduring and powerful political, economic and social union because it's imperfect. The solution to these flaws is to seek to fix them, not abandon the whole process. We often congratulate ourselves on how pro-European the people of Scotland are. This is a mistake. We must continue to argue the case for staying in the EU. We must highlight the benefits that derive from our continued membership and the potential losses that would arise if we left. But we must also say what being in the EU, EU says about us. It shows that we want to be open to the world and part of things that are bigger than ourselves. We want to cooperate with others and not close ourselves off. We want to contribute to the world and influence global affairs. Scotland's place in the EU is at its heart. We benefit from the economic and social union inherent to the European Union. We all enjoy the direct and indirect benefits of our continued membership. Being a part of the EU is a powerful statement about our place in the world and how we view ourselves. We should use our place in the EU to press the case for action on inequality and on vitally important problems such as youth unemployment. That would be of far more practical help to the people of Scotland than the partisan and divisive agendas that others seek to pursue. We should ensure that we do everything we can to protect and strengthen our position in the EU. It's clear our voice is amplified on the world stage by our continued membership of the EU and it's amplified within the EU itself by our continued membership of the UK. Thank you. Thank you. A final open debate speaker before we turn to closing speeches is Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2012, this Parliament hosted an exhibition of the Wallace Letters, which included the Lubeck Letter. Considered to be one of the few artefacts remaining with a connection to Wallace, it was written in 1297 and states that Scotland is ready to trade with the ports of the Hanseatic League. Presiding officer, this is just one example of Scotland reaching out to trade with our European neighbours, then, as we do now, as enthusiastic, engaged and committed members of the European Union. And it was I thus. Scottish links to Europe, ancient and modern, can be found across the whole of, of the European Union. In Bruges, for example, it was one of the great commercial centres of Europe. And at one point, most of the wool being exported from Scotland to the rest of Europe went through its ports. As such, a community of Scottish merchants settled here, there, sorry, more than 700 years ago. Bruges today holds a College of Europe, which is one, the first university to offer studies in European affairs, and the Scottish Government funds scholarships to that institution to this day. Another example of the way in which Scotland's prosperity over the centuries has been bound with the ability to trade, travel and work in Europe. And just as Scots have always worked and lived in Europe, so there are now 160,000 odd people from other EU states have chosen to live, to work in Scotland. And as has been detailed by many of the contributions this afternoon, they have a massive contribution to Scotland's economy and culture. These European connections are an essential part of who we are. Scotland has always been a nation that looks outwards to its neighbours in Wales, like England, Ireland and Northern Ireland, and to the other nations of Europe. And we also welcome visitors to our land. Indeed, it is this that has uh, led to the historian Tom Devine to describe us as a mongrel nation. And if I stop to reflect just what that means to me, that means that I am a Scottish citizen, a British citizen and a European citizen. But if this Scottish citizen embraces a European citizenship but is told being a British citizen makes that impossible, that's a personal conflict for me. And so it is for our whole nation. And for those who cannot see that this would be a constitutional conflict, simply have their heads in the sand. 
Liam MacArthur mentioned the Second World War, and in 1946, Winston Churchill made a famous speech in Zurich, which helped to inspire early pro-European attitudes following the Second World War. He said that a stronger European partnership would, quote, make the material strength of a single state less important. Small nations will count as much as large ones and gain their honour by their contribution to common cause. And Scotland has made a great contribution to the European cause. There is no doubt my preference would be that that happen as an independent nation within Europe. But nonetheless, as a member of the family of nations of the UK, we continue to make our contribution to Europe. As a member of the European Committee, I have watched... I a brief yes, I certainly will. Thank you. Dennis Robertson. Officer. Would a member agree that although Scotland makes uh, uh, an important contribution to Europe, they also make an important contribution to Scotland? Claire Adamson. Absolutely concur. It is a two-way street. It's a two-way um, exchange of ideas, of influence and of trade, and one that has served Scotland and the rest of Europe well um, in, over the centuries. I have been greatly honoured to witness small nations take the presidency of the European Union in my time in this parliament, Denmark, Lithuania and notably Ireland, who concluded the negotiations of the EU's financials uh, up until 2020. Small nations similar in size to Scotland taking a pivotal role in Europe and we should continue to do so as, as a small nation within this family of nations. But we find ourselves at the moment in a very Eurosceptic position. If I return to Bruges, Margaret Thatcher made a speech there which was at the time seemed out of kilter and um, was a Euroscepticism that was unheard of in the European Union. It was unfortunately that rhetoric from both um, some of the Conservatives and from UKIP leads us to a much much more Eurosceptic position then. But even at that time Margaret Thatcher was not arguing that we should come out of Europe, but just change the way in which Europe worked. But we now find ourselves with David Cameron's proposal to hold a, an in-out referendum in a position that would, seems alien to Scotland and that very few politicians in this country would have argued for under any circumstances. And while I appreciate that um, Jamie McGregor in his speech talked of his pro-European stance, Unfortunately, that's not the rhetoric that's coming through during this election campaign. I take no pleasure in this, but I'm going to quote from David Coburn in his written evidence to the European Parliament. And he said, UKIP and its anti-establishment, anti-EU, EFDD group allies have been highly successful in highlighting and warning Scottish businesses, agriculture, fisheries and the Scots in general of damaging European directive issued by an out-of-touch oligarchic, unelected commission supervised by a eunuch European Parliament, end quote. Challenging and intemperate language, and not for the first time from Mr Coburn, but that is what is driving the call for an in-out European referendum. It is not the position as laid out by Mr McGregor this afternoon. So I hope that Scotland will embrace the opportunities of a renegotiated position within Europe, one that could offer uh, a reinforced public trust in the European Uni Europeans' governance and its ability to materially improve the lives of people, as, as mentioned by many of my Labour colleagues in the Chamber this afternoon, about what it can do to, in workers' rights. Um, there is also an opportunity to prioritise economic policies that stimulate sustainable growth and have a place in social policies that ensure everyone can benefit from that growth and improve our country. And there is also an opportunity for that yet an un <laughs> um, completed European dream of a big European project that will absolutely bind, bind us. And if we look to some of the challenges of um, global warming, there is an opportunity perhaps in the future that we could have um, a, um, a, a grid that would allow euro renewable energy across Europe to, to benefit and, um, and to interlink our countries even more um, in, in one of these proposed great European projects that have come up over the years. So I, for one, want to stay in Europe. Thank you. We now turn to our closing speeches and I call on Cameron Buchanan around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think it's ironic that I've never heard the SNP speak so much about family when not long ago they were voting to leave a different family. 
Anyway, I would like to thank members for their contributions to this afternoon's debate and to support my colleague Jamie McGregor's amendment. It is clear across the chamber that we all value Scotland's and the wider UK's ties with Europe, and that, I think, is very much to be welcomed. Having spent time at La Sorbonne in Paris and with my exposure to Europe's rich tapestry of culture and language through past business activities, I can certainly agree that there is an intrinsic cultural, social, economic value to Scotland's interactions with our friends across the continent. But we must nevertheless accept that many people throughout the United Kingdom feel that the European Union must change. It is fair to say that it is not the same institution that the UK chose to join in 1973 that the UK electorate voted two to one to remain part of in 1975. The Euro European Union... Certainly. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, in the uh, Conservative Amendment, it uh, talks about negotiating a new settlement for the UK. Would that involve treaty change? And if that involves treaty change, will that not lead to countries like Ireland, who can only allow treaty change through a referendum in their country, having a veto over any negotiations the UK may take, undertake? Cammy Buchanan. Thank you for that. Uh, no, I think it's not just a treaty change. I think we're trying to alter some of the petty rules that we've got in the European Union. There are too many petty rules. We haven't actually defined yet what the petty... Well, we know what the petty rules are. The European Union today is, not, is too bureaucratic, it's too undemocratic. It is now known more to the general public for unnecessary interference than for the positive, membership that mem positive benefits that membership brings, such as the single market and free trade. The creep of EU red tape continues while ever closer union looms largely at the expense of our national sovereignty. And since 1975, the geopolitical environment has changed. We've experienced one of the worst cr economic crises in living memory. Forty years have passed since the British people last had a say on the EU, and it's simply not good enough. That's why the Conservatives have committed to negotiate a new settlement, not treaty, for the UK in Europe, followed by an in-out referendum before the end of 2017. Certainly. Bien sûr. Christian Allard. I thank the member for taking the division. And, presenting Officer, I would like to ask if Mr Cameron Buchanan will maybe help me on one particular matter. You, we have been talking about having a referendum to take uh, Britain out of the EU. We had a referendum last year, which I participated, and many, many uh, EU migrants participated. Will we participate to that referendum or not? Cameron Buchanan. Our referendum is not to take the, uh, Britain out of the EU, it is to renegotiate the terms. The EU, sorry. Order, please. Of course you will. Bien sûr. <laughs> Order, please. I can't. It's not my... Mr point. Buchanan, are you taking another intervention? Because if not, I can't have conversations across the chamber. Fine. Sorry. Sorry. This is why the UK in 2013 launched a campaign to cut EU red tape. In the first year alone, that campaign brought about savings to UK businesses of over £200 million. Further reforms potentially are worth up to half a billion pounds to the UK businesses and they are still being implemented. Further, as part of the cut EU red tape campaign, the UK government is supporting the adoption of a common sense filter for all new European Commission proposals called the Compete Principles. It is also out to put a stop to the practice of gold plating, ensuring that government does not go beyond the minimum requirement of EU law when implementing EU directives. And this is clearly in the UK interest. Presiding officer, these are but a few examples of the, many, of the many things we're trying to do to reform the EU. The Conservatives have also cut the EU budget for the first time in its history. We got Britain out of the Eurozone bailouts and we protected our rebate. And the Conservatives have campaigned to end the travelling circus of the European Parliament, decamping from Brussels to Strasbourg once a month, which reportedly cost 200, 928 million over the seven year cycle. The Conservatives have a track record for change in Europe but we are going further than that. We want the UK's membership of the EU to have a popular mandate and we want to serve the best interests of the British people. Forty years ago, the referendum on the European community was held on the basis of a simple one-to-one -one person vote system. The referendum on independence last year had no additional requirements other than a simple majority of votes. To suggest additional terms, i.e. a double majority, that could potentially prevent the UK from leaving the EU, even when three out of the four constituent parts have voted in favour, is not democracy in action. It is not a popular vote. 
And according to the recent Chatham House YouGov survey, it is not what the people of Great Britain want. 60% now of the public are in favour of referendum, and only 24% are opposed. It is my hope that we can bring about together the necessary reforms to change the European Union for the better. It is for the British people from all corners of the United Kingdom to decide if they wish to stay. Either way, the Conservatives will respect that decision, and I vote in favour of the motion. Jamie McGregor's motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I turn to the next closing speaker, I would remind members that everyone who's participated in a debate should be here for closing speeches. I was about to say that I noted Hans Alan Malik was not in the chamber, and I'd be grateful for an explanation. However, I have just seen Mr Malik enter the chamber. I now call on Claire Baker. Eight minutes, please. Presiding officer, uh, as I said on my opening, this is my first speech um, in this um, European team as such with these committee members and the MSPs who have an interest in Europe. And I found it very interesting and encouraging with largely positive contributions. Um, as a literature graduate, I very much welcome the cultural comments from um, Christian Allard <laughs> and also the Dutch from Stuart Stevenson, uh, which managed to entertain us uh, this afternoon. Uh, members have covered a wide range of issues, including um, workforce issues. Uh, Michael McMahon described the workforce benefits that have successfully been fought for within the EU and more that we need to do within that. Um, Cara Hilton talked about tackling tax avoidance and the greater role for the EU to play in that. Um, Christian Allard talked about the need for cooperation um, and he highlighted the case of human trafficking as an important um, angle that in a modern world to solve these problems we need to work in cooperation. Um, many members talked about the need for the EU to be less remote and more engaged with its electorate. And Dennis Robertson described the feeling of remoteness very well and gave a good description of the role that culture in our languages, in our performances, in our, in our human relationships to better improve our engagement with Europe. Um, this afternoon we have three different proposals before us which I imagine won't gain much cross-party support across the chamber um, at decision time. Um, this is a pity because there is, I think, much that we appear to agree with this afternoon. Europe is positive for Scotland. It is good for our economy. Being part of the Union brings us positive social and cultural benefits and there is much we can learn from each other. Um, last year I went to the first rural parliament conference in Scotland and that is a model that we've seen working well in Europe for uh, to benefit of rural communities. Uh, we have a long history of trade and movement with Europe and our modern institutions support these relationships in a way which looks to bring fairness and prosperity to Europe. We are in many ways in a strong position in Europe, um, notwithstanding the comments made, I'm afraid I can't remember which member um, raised it, about the current Conservative government's approach towards Europe. Certainly the Conservatives have a different history of Europe. Um, it's not universal within their party, but they're not enthousi enthusiastically European. Um, I believe that Nick Clegg has only represented the UK government once in Europe in the early phases of the coalition. And sometimes I imagine where we would be now if, if that had continued. Um, but notwithstanding that, we do have strengths in Europe. By continuing to be part of the pound rather than the euro, we have the advantage of our own currency while retaining full access to the single market. So it is important that we make the case for staying in the European Union a strong one. The costs of leaving the community um, that we've been part of for more than four decades far outweigh any outcomes that we would get in return. And for an organisation that was founded to oppose aggression between states, it's vital we play a full part in its future. Instead, we should ensure that Britain continues to have an impact on Europe in the best way possible. And as Christian Allard described, free, free movement within the European Union allows Scottish people to move, to live, to work and study throughout these countries that are also part of the EU, as well as allowing other EU citizens um, to come to Scotland. This is a vital aspect for the growth of the country, as well as Europe as a whole. Um, and the possibility of shutting ourselves out of this opportunity to move freely throughout much of Europe is not only detrimental to those who benefit from coming to Scotland and the UK, but also to our citizens who benefit from the opportunities other parts of Europe offers. Briefly. Christian Allard. I thank you very much, the member, for taking the intervention. Talking about all the EU migrants who came into, into this country and, and, and contributed to society, what a great contribution we have is we are allowed to vote, which I did in the referendum and many of us last year. Would the Labour Party support me voting in this, this particular referendum that the Conservative Party is supporting? Claire Baker, I can give you your time back. 
Um, sorry, I said, was the member asking about voting rights in any EU ref a possible EU referendum? Yes. Would um, I have the right to vote? Yeah, I don't support an EU referendum. I'm hoping we have a Labour government and we don't have an EU referendum after May. Um, Christina McKelvey talked about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership this afternoon. I was pleased to have the support of the SNP earlier this year, joining Labour and the Greens to have the NHS protected from private incursions by US healthcare providers. It is imperative that the NHS is exempt from any trade agreement. Trade agreements are important and we want to get the benefits from an increasingly global marketplace and we do need to seek new opportunities. If we don't take these other opportunities, um, other countries and markets will. However, member states across the EU will have concerns about what impact this could have on their public services. And in the, e the UK, we must not accept the inclusion of the NHS. Um, I see the committee published their report this morning. I know they have conducted an in-depth inquiry into the issue, and I'll take time to look at their conclusions. But I do welcome their focus on protection of the NHS. Uh, President officer, in this morning's media, the minister talked about a Eurosceptic Westminster. And um, Stuart Maxwell kind of wrapped up all the UK parties together in this. This mis misrepresents parties' positions on Europe to suit a nationalist narrative. Labour is not Eurosceptic. The Liberals are not Eurosceptic. The Greens are not Eurosceptic. Mm -hmm. uh, briefly. Stuart Maxwell. Thank you for taking the intervention. Well, I I'm, I'm sorry you took that view. I was specifically talking about the Tory government and the Tory policies. I think several times explicitly said the Tory party, so, and I never mentioned the Labour once, so I, I'm sorry you took that view, because that's not what I intended. Claire Baker. Okay, I, I accept um, Stuart Maxwell's response to that. I had thought that he had talked about a Westminster elite that wrapped the parties up together, but I appreciate uh, the points that he's made. However, um, the First Minister was in London yesterday calling for Welsh voters to vote for Clyde Cymru and English voters to vote Green. And the consequence of this isn't Britain dancing to the tune of UKIP for the next five years, but Britain dancing to the tune of the Conservatives for the next five mm -hmm. years, guaranteeing an in-out referendum that most people in this chamber don't want to see. Um, uh, also, some of the comments this afternoon um, from Stuart Maxwell and uh, Willie Coffey looked in some ways to rerun some of the aspects of the referendum last year. Um, and I know there was disappointment in the Chamber at the result of that referendum from some members, but the majority of people did vote to stay in the UK. And members were right to say the debate in Scotland suggested that people in Scotland wanted to stay in Europe. And the vote showed that the arguments around continuing EU membership, the strength of the UK as the member state, the retention of the rebate and other UK benefits won the day. Um, but the SNP's case on Europe at the time was not credible and was not supported by a significant majority of EU experts. But the key thing was it didn't have the support of the decision makers who repeatedly highlighted the difficulty of securing the agreement of 28 member states. And for those MSPs this afternoon who were sounding like they were positively looking forward to an in-out referendum, which would cause a constitutional crisis, they should reflect on some of last week's reports um, of Fiona Hislop's own concerns over the price of Scotland leaving the EU and negotiating its own membership, concerns that were glossed over in a subsequent white paper. Um, but that was last year, and we now need to move on to the circumstances presented to us um, currently. Uh, Presiding Officer, as Liam MacArthur outlined, the Smith Commission brought forward proposals for strengthening Scotland's role in the UK and the EU, and good practice is already in place. In December, Angela Constance attended and spoke at both the Employment Council and the Education Council as the sole UK representative. And at the December Fisheries Council, key Scottish objectives were secured. In fact, I was much encouraged by the Cabinet Secretary's positive report to the European Committee on Scotland's EU engagement through the UK. Of course, where there are weaknesses, and Rupert Ponsonby, the 7th Baron de Molle, leading on fishing negotiations when Richard Lockhead was there, is a case in point. Um, and I was critical of that decision at the time. We do need to learn lessons from these kind of examples. However, if we improve Scotland's role in the UK delegation, as I believe the Smith proposals will do, Scotland will continue to carry the influence as one of the larger member states. So let's improve the working relationships we have, but retain the advantages that come from UK membership of the EU. I um, also thought Liam MacArthur gave a fair analysis of the problems with the double majority proposal. Um, you know, as I said in my opening comments, uh, I don't think that proposal is credible. It would be similar to a majority making a decision in last year's referendum, but a local authority area being able to veto it. And Scotland stayed in the UK last year with the knowledge that there could be an EU referendum, and we chose to continue to make decisions in these reserved areas together. 
Um, presiding officer, in conclusion, this has been a wide-ranging debate. There has been some rehashing of older arguments and the rehearsal of some future ones. Um, but in our different proposals this afternoon, we won't find much agreement at decision time. But there is much agreement than disagreement in the Chamber. And Rod Campbell set out some of the positive arguments, including supportive comments from businesses about the importance of the UK's role in Europe. And we do have a task before us to continue and strengthen the UK's membership of the EU to win the arguments, not just economic, but also emotional. This is a union that is built around the desire for peace and cooperation. We have a responsibility to tell our story of Europe, both its history and its future, and to ensure we continue to play a positive part in it. Many thanks. I now call on Hamza Yusuf to wind up. Uh, Minister, you have until 4.48pm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. I should have Sorry, 458. My... 50. <laughs> well, yes, indeed. Uh, I, I understood what you meant. Uh, I, I should have, in my opening remarks, welcomed uh, the fact that Claire Baker is making her first uh, summing up an, an opening for Labour in her new role. So, uh, she did that uh, very, very well, I thought, very succinctly, uh, and got to the, the heart of uh, many issues. And as Claire Baker says, uh, and many other members have reflected, it's actually been a very uh, good debate, very positive debate uh, about the benefits. Uh, of, of, of the EU. And I don't know if there was a similar debate in other parliaments and uh, assemblies uh, across this, uh, these islands, whether it would be as positive uh, as it certainly was uh, in the Scottish Parliament. So I commend all the members for that. Uh, uh, very supportive uh, approach. I'm encouraged that there's been broad uh, agreement around the Scottish Government's priorities uh, as well in the EU, which many of the members of the EERC uh, have, have, have at time questioned, of course, the Cabinet Secretary to my left and also myself on these priorities. And during those sessions, I've found very broad agreement, and I'm pleased that's been reflected uh, here in this chamber as well. Uh, I want to pick up on a few of the points uh, that, that, that were raised. I think all of us uh, said that the relationship with the European Union, Scotland's relationship with the European Union, was more than just trade and investment. There was a social purpose to it as well, uh, reducing inequality uh, and fighting, fighting poverty. I, I, thought the, I thought I'd better respond to the comments that were made by Claire Baker and McTaggart, uh, I think possibly Cara Hilton and, and, and Michael McMahon in regards to SNP MEPs uh, and the voting. I had a look at the uh, issue that was mentioned. First of all, uh, there wasn't a legally uh, binding vote by any stretch. It was an own initiative uh, report. Uh, the uh, reason why SNP MEPs, Green MEPs, and actually the rest of the group that the Labour Party MEPs belong to voted against it, uh, or in our case abstained on it, uh, was because uh, the definition of atypical labour, uh, that, could that could include uh, loan parents on a part-time uh, contract, for example, uh, that could be affected. So it's the interpretation uh, which was uh, the problem. But I think all of us uh, generally will, be, will, will look towards the European Union uh, to ensure that fighting inequality and reducing poverty uh, most certainly is at uh, the heart of that. Also uh, heartened greatly by the level of support that members have shown uh, for Scotland's continued uh, membership uh, of the European Union, the real benefits uh, that we get uh, from that, not just access uh, to those half a billion uh, European consumers uh, but also uh, and the businesses, but more than that. And I thought Lee MacArthur uh, raised a good point on structural funds, as others uh, did here too. But perhaps we're not good at actually uh, delving down into making those relevant to what they actually mean to people. So the 985 million euros uh, that, that was mentioned by a variety of members add to that the match funding from the Scottish Government, taking that up to 1.9 uh, billion. What does that actually mean? What does it actually do for the people on the ground uh, that we represent? An example of that would be, for example, uh, that, that, that uh, European Structural Funds funded Ayrshire Youth Employment Service that so far has created 1,250 job opportunities uh, in Ayrshire, benefiting uh, from some £1.6 billion, pounds worth, uh, billion yes, pounds worth of funding uh, since 2013. Yes. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister is uh, uh, outlining many of the positive aspects of being in Europe, in which there are many. Uh, but why is it then um, that the people seem to be disengaged when it comes to voting in European elections, when we've got these absolutely positive benefits of being members uh, within the European uh, Union, uh, but we don't seem to get this message across? Who's failing? Minister. 
I think certainly we all bear responsibility, and it goes back to the point I was just trying to, to make uh, to, to the Chamber, that uh, if we don't translate the positive benefits of European membership into what it actually means for people's everyday lives, uh, then why would people be interested? And on top of that, uh, you know, in, in our own EU reform agenda, we've said very clearly uh, that, we should, that the European Union should be tackling issues that matter to people. The mass youth uh, unemployment that we see uh, across the European continent would be uh, one of those examples. Uh, yes. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful and, and hopefully this comment will um, be helpful, I think, in responding to a legitimate concern Dennis Robertson's raised, that it doesn't help uh, a situation where member states, I think, across Europe um, have a track record of going along to council meetings, signing up to inevitable compromise agreements and then tearing apart the agreement they've signed up to uh, in order to protect themselves from criticism from the aspect of the compromise that their citizens are slightly less uh, enamoured with. Minister. So who would have thought? Politicians playing politics, uh, but that it can happen. And I agree with him, though. I mean, I'm sure uh, it certainly uh, isn't helpful, but his point is uh, certainly a relevant one. Uh, Scotland uh, will, in terms of funding, uh, continue to have opportunity to bid into a range of, of EU competitive funding programmes. Scottish universities uh, have managed to, to win £572 million Euros, uh, worth of funding over the last uh, financial period of 2007 to, to 2014. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, that represents over 1.3% of the entire EU research budget. Again, I'd like to give reassurances uh, to those that have raised, uh, and Claire Baker and others, uh, the reduction of Horizon 2020. Yes, we don't want to see any uh, further uh, reduction of that, but we hope that through Juncker's investment package that actually academic institutions and research institutions will be able to, to benefit uh, from that. Uh, I thought Hans Alan Malik... It was slightly unfair, but I understood the position and the point that he was trying to raise about uh, third sector organisations uh, trying to tap into EU funding. I thought it was slightly unfair to say that no progress uh, had been made. I had spoken to, to him and other committee members uh, recently about uh, the funding portal that Scotland and Europa uh, have created because of the exact reason uh, and the points that he, he, he mentioned. Uh, that funding portal, uh, which is launched, or, or the beta version is launched, uh, will become a one-stop shop uh, for information uh, on the 40 or so EU funds that are currently available uh, to, to people in Scotland, so organisations in Scotland. It will also provide information on projects currently running or completed, which involve Scottish partners as well. Indeed, there's information uh, on project partners and self. Yes, very briefly. Uh, Malik. Uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the fact you're taking the intervention. Um, yes, perhaps I was a little unfair. It's just that I f feel very passionate about the third sector and our small companies. And I, what I'm really saying is, rather than just a one-stop shop, I actually want to see officers on the ground physically taking people and supporting them and helping them do the, the job, because at the moment that's missing. Minister? I would refer the, 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 the member to Scotland Europa. They do an excellent job uh, in that regard. They have a number of organisations, but uh, there's always more that we can do, and I'm happy to, to, to reflect on that. But our Brussels office, very hardworking as well, which the member will know, as well as Scottish Development International uh, and other partners. But, of course, uh, more can always be done. Uh, the benefits that we've discussed in this debate that flow from uh, European Union membership, be they the talent pool uh, that migration uh, to Scotland brings, or indeed economics or the free trade, uh, are not advanced in the name of arguing for the status quo. We all agree that things uh, need to be changed uh, and that uh, there needs to be some level of reform. But that uh, change can be best advanced. Uh, yes, very McGregor. All right. Uh, I, I thought um, Dennis Robertson made a very good point about the apathy of EU voters. And I, mean, I think that stems from a feeling that, that, that there is little that individual people can do to change things in Europe. And I, I wondered just if, as you say, you agree that there should be reform, um, if it is not a good thing that the Conservative Party is actually pushing for these reforms about the things which are actually not beneficial, rather than the things that are beneficial coming out of Europe. Minister. It's interesting in the Conservatives' own led balance of uh, competences review, where they look through departments and with a fine tooth comb in terms of its relationship with Europe and whether there was a need for reform, actually it found that the balance was just about right. Uh, and so when I was listening to uh, Jimmy McGregor's speech in this chamber, uh, he started by saying how pro-European he was and then spent the la next six minutes telling us everything that was wrong with Europe. Uh, and I could almost hear the gritting of his teeth as he was doing so. But uh, the point is that uh, where reform is necessary, it won't be achieved 
through holding a gun to, to, to Europe's head in that regard. Uh, the EU does need to show it means business uh, by tackling the bureaucracy that Jamie McGregor talked about uh, and, and having a root and branch review of existing regulatory burdens. The refit programme is therefore welcomed, of course, uh, with all the caveats that it does not uh, lower any environmental standards and so on and so forth. And I was waiting when Jimmy McGregor was talking about reforms. I was looking to, to hear what exactly he, what, what exact reforms uh, he needed. And the Conservatives are yet to produce something that says, OK, these are the top three reforms that we want to see, and does it require treaty change or not? I thought Michael McMahon was very good uh, in, in, in uh, highlighting the uh, alternatives to European uh, membership, which could be very, very dangerous uh, indeed, and, and mentioning Norway and Switzerland uh, perhaps in those remarks and mentioning that uh, EFTA, the other alternative, would just simply be uh, unacceptable. It would, give us, it, would have, it would mean that Europe would be running uh, our country, but we wouldn't be able to have any say in that. And just as he was talking, I, I could hear the voice of the late and great Margot MacDonald uh, trying to argue otherwise. But I, I think you know, we absolutely agree that Scotland is best placed uh, within uh, the European Union as we currently are. In regards to the in-out referendum, presiding officer. Uh, I would say that we don't have to wait, and we hope there isn't an EU in a referendum, we don't support it, but if there is, uh, we don't have to wait till that referendum to argue about the benefits of the European Union. We've never argued uh, that there shouldn't be a vote for uh, you know, all people of the United Kingdom, just in, in, in regards to the Scottish independence referendum. Nobody seriously argued that everybody across the United Kingdom should get a vote, because that was for the vote of the Scottish people. Uh, yes, very, very good. Christian Allard. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Uh, can I ask him on behalf of the people who voted in the referendum, the independence referendum last year, or the uh, people coming from the EU, like myself, Will uh, he push the Westminster government, the unlikely event that David Cameron is elected, and we've got a referendum out, out to, to get out of the EU, that we will have a vote uh, uh, on it as well? Minister? Yeah, well, we, we, we don't want a referendum, but of course we, we don't feel like Christian Allard and others should be disenfranchised uh, if, if one is there. But a decision that could have potentially devastating impacts on our economy, devastating impacts for those migrant communities that live here, devastating impacts... Uh, upon the academic sector, it would be unimaginable that if in this family uh, of nations an equal voice uh, in the United Kingdom, that Scotland was somehow dragged against its will uh, outside of the European Union. It would be absolutely unacceptable. And that's why we are putting forward a motion today which simply says that Scotland should have an equal voice. It would be an, quite incredible that we have a Welsh First Minister in Carwyn Jones who says that the proposal is worth considering. Having a Welsh Labour First Minister saying that Scotland should have an equal voice, but potentially by five o'clock today, the Labour Party in Scotland voting against that equal voice. I am in the Minister's got ten minute. seconds. And so I will end by saying that I hope that members across this chamber that will vote to give Scotland an equal voice uh, in the European Union not allow us to be dragged outside of the European Union uh, against our will and continue to make the case for Scotland and indeed the UK to remain within the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland's place in Europe. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion numbers 12625 and 12626 in the name of Liam MacArthur, on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body on amendments to the Scottish Parliament's salary scheme and the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme. I call on Liam MacArthur to move and speak to the motions. Mr MacArthur. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. On behalf of the Corporate Body, I'm pleased to put forward two separate resolutions, as you say, on the Scottish Parliament's salary scheme and the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme. Uh, the first of these is to make an amendment to the salary scheme that breaks the current link of MSPs' salaries to the salaries of MPs, which are in turn determined by IPSA. The proposed amendment will replace that link with a new mechanism which will directly link MSPs' salaries to future public sector pay rises in Scotland. I now formally therefore move motion S4M12625 on the Scottish Parliament salary scheme. Turning to the second re resolution uh, proposed by the corporate body, this is to extend the existing transitional arrangements on the employment of family members up to the 31st of July 2016. 
Uh, this keeps it in line with the original intent of the Macintosh recommendation. Uh, it follows the extension of the current parliamentary session from four years to five years to avoid a clash with the forthcoming UK general election. And consequently, I formally move motion S4M 12626 on the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. MacArthur. The decision on these most will put it, put it decision time to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to the debate on Scotland's place in Europe, if the amendment in the name of Claire Baker is agreed, the amendment in the name of Jamie McGregor falls? The first question then is that amendment number 12670.2 in the name of Claire Baker which seeks to amend motion number 12670 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on Scotland's place in Europe be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12670.2 in the name of Claire Baker is as follows. Yes, 33. No, 63. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12670.1 in the name of Jamie McGregor, which seeks to amend motion number 12670 in the name of Hamza Yousaf, on Scotland's place in Europe, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12670.1 in the name of Jamie McGregor is as follows. Yes, 14. No, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12670 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on Scotland's place in Europe be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12670 in the name of Hamza Yousaf is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 47. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12625 in the name of Liam MacArthur on amendments to Scottish Parliament salary scheme be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12626 in the name of Liam MacArthur on the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.